Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Everyone, can you please turn on your cameras if you are joining us online? Yes, I believe that we have a lot of our participants who are joining us online as well as offline. Thank you very much for turning on your cameras. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, I greet you to the 2021 HERA International Symposium. My name is Ju Yun Cho, and I have been given the honor of being your MC today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your participation. This year, we are hosting our 2021 HERA International Symposium under the title DUR and the Accomplishments Over the Past 10 Years, Including DUR, ITS, and Its Response to COVID-19. And as the title suggests, we will be celebrating our 10th anniversary, as well as sharing our best practices and accomplishments in responding to COVID-19, and of course, future directions and developments with uh, different countries that are interested in creating an, an environment for the drug safe management. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are holding the online conference in order to prevent the spread of COVID-19. It is unfortunate that we were not able to host all of our guests together offline, but we are joined by various different panelists and, of course, our audiences online. So we kindly ask for your uh, attention and participation. So over the next four hours, we will be conducting our symposium with our keynote and our sessions. And of course, we ask for your attention and participation for tomorrow onwards with the international training course. So before we begin, first and foremost, allow me to introduce some of our distinguished guests who have joined us here today. Dr. Sun Min Kim, Executive Director of HERA is with us. Thank you very much. And Dr. Hyunung Shin, the Director of Planning at HERA, is also here with us. Dr. Yong Myung Chang, Director of Benefits Management at HERA, is joining us. Ms. Nam Hee Kim, Director of Review and Assessment at HERA, is also with us. Thank you very much. And Professor Pyeongju Park from Seoul National University is joining us. Thank you very much. And Dr. Tinyong Lee, the Director of Health Insurance Review and Assessment at the Research Institute is here. Thank you very much. Mr. Char Su Kim, the Department Director at HERA is here. Thank you very much. Last but not least, Ms. Seol Hee Chung, Department Director at HERA, also joins us. Thank you very much. Thank you for your offline participation We're with us today. And in addition, we're also joined by some overseas participants who will be our keynote speakers and session panelists. So Dr. Nick Klazinga from the OECD will be our keynote speaker. Professor Libby Rughead from the University of South Australia. And Dr. Luke Slavomirsky from the OECD will be joining us. Moreover, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to all of our distinguished guests both online and offline for your precious time with us and now ladies and gentlemen to open our symposium I'd like to introduce Dr. Sun Min Kim executive director of HERA for her opening remarks please welcome her with a big round of applause Good afternoon and uh, good morning to some of my friends and good night or good evening to some of my friends. 
I'm Sun Min Kim, the president of uh, Health Insurance Review and Assessment Service of Korea. First of all, I would like to welcome you all to this uh, 2021 uh, International Symposium and HERA training course. Thank you very much for attending this momentous event uh, from home and abroad and through online and offline. And I, I want to particularly thank our distinguished speakers who accepted our invitation to speak at this unique opportunity to share their expertise. Before opening the event, uh, let me start by expressing my sincere gratitude to all health workers and disease control authorities in the world, including Korea, who are continuously working very hard to combat this prolonged, combat, uh, prolonged pandemic of COVID-19. Across the globe, the vaccination rate is fortunately gradually increasing, and uh, some nations declared living with the COVID-19 strategy as their next step. Korean government is also preparing for the post-COVID-19 time to go back to a very beautiful normal life. With the national top priority being safety of the public, we will be able to recover and regain our peaceful life in the near future. Actually, COVID-19 is expected to fundamentally transform not only the health sector, but also many other aspects of our lives in terms of education, economy and culture, including online symposium like today. In the post-COVID-19 era, uh, it is strongly expected that uh, we will observe a rapid development of the fourth industrialization, including AI, big data, and uh, Internet of Things. Health sector, should prepare itself to embrace such a great change before the time comes. The COVID-19 crippled the world's economy in an unprecedented manner, uh, but I am confident that uh, the international society can uh, and will overcome this crisis as long as we continue to work together. HERA will always stay relevant to the global collaboration for the better future beyond COVID-19. HERA is uh, dedicated to benefit uh, claims review and the quality assessment of the national health insurance uh, system as well as the international cooperation and exchanges uh, for the betterment of the public health and the national health insurance program, such as building uh, systematic support for quality enhancement and safe use of drug. I'd like to stress there the importance of uh, drug utilization review system, which is, was, has been uh, uh, operated by HERA. The DUR uh, has guaranteed uh, safe use of the drug for patients by preventing prescription and dispensing of hazardous drugs and by providing customized base uh, data based uh, on its accumulated uh, databases. In addition to this conventional work in recent years, DUR has played a very key role to fight against the spread of COVID-19 by providing information such as overseas entrance, close contact of the COVID-19 confirmed patients, vaccination history, and epidemiological 
investigation to healthcare institutions and the Korean Disease Control and Prevention Ag Agency uh, uh, named KCDA, KDCA uh, in a real-time manner. So today, uh, to memorate uh, the 10 history, 10 year history of DUR, we are opening three day international symposium and training course, which will reflect the uh, history of DUR operation it, and its achievement alongside with the DUR and ITS used for the fight against the COVID-19. By sharing HERA's roles and history with the global community, we would like to seek ways to promote international exchanges for building safe environment for pharmaceutical safety management in the future. We are very excited to learn new insights and suggestions offered by our renowned speakers and attendees including Dr. Nick Klazinga. On the second and third day, HERA will share uh, its experience as the strategic purchaser. As you well know, HERA's know-how on health expenditure management will be valuable input for the international society, especially for those who are working towards the universal health coverage uh, in the time of the COVID-19. As you well know, universal health coverage is critically important to, uh, to recover from this kind of uh, uh, health crisis. The lectures in the training course will cover core responsibilities of HERA, such as benefit claims review, quality assessment, and benefit criteria management. In addition, the Korean Central, Korea and Central America session is prepared to strengthen exchanges and collaboration in public health sector between two sides. I wish you a valuable and productive dialogue and exchanges. Throughout uh, the overall session, uh, HERA staff will closely monitor and respond using real-time chat room uh, so the lecturers can be very uh, interactive. It is my sincere hope that all the attendees and speakers will be uh, able to use this opportunity to take a leap forward for their public sector and advancement in this very hard time of pandemic. I'd like to thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you once again, Dr. Kim, for your encouraging remarks, as well as a brief introduction of uh, today and the two days ahead. Thank you very much for your opening remarks. Following suit, ladies and gentlemen, we have a lot of congratulatory messages that were sent over for the 10th anniversary of HERA and our international symposium. First of all, I'd like to introduce a congratulatory message that was sent by video from Mr. Kun Hyuk Ryu, Vice Minister of the Ministry of Health and Welfare of the Republic of Korea. Please welcome him on screen. Yeah, 건강보험 심사 평가원이 개최하는 국제 심포지엄과 국제 연수 과정을 진심으로 축하드리며 함께해 주신 국내 and thank you all for participating in this meaningful event. Over the last two decades, HERA has been a locomotive in managing public health care and expenditure and improving the quality of medical care, of which accomplishments have put the Korean healthcare system on their international level and for it to be disseminated to countries around the globe. 
In particular, since the inception of the healthcare system in 1977, over the last four decades, Hira was able to accumulate healthcare information and big data and utilize ITC technology, creating irreplaceable experience and assets to our healthcare insurance system, distinguished guest. Today's symposium is in celebration of the 10-year anniversary of the adoption of the DUR system, which forms the foundation of Hira's big data and ICT prowess. Hira's DUR system was launched as part of a pilot program in Goyang City and Jeju Island in 2008 and was widespread nationwide in December 2010. Ever since, the product listing scope has been growing and growing. This service not only focuses on adverse reaction prevention, but is becoming a true national safety service reflecting the voices of physicians and sharing information in real time. In particular, since 2009, in the midst of the number of infectious diseases ranging from Ebola, virus and MERS, also in the midst of the heightened COVID-19 crisis in 2020, the DUR system has stood firm and was leveraged to protect the health of our nationals. In particular, it played a pivotal role in preemptively responding to the spread of COVID-19. Since the early onset of COVID-19, abundant information has been provided, including patient entrance and exit records of the nationwide medical facilities and contract tracing data to further prevent the pandemic from spreading. Thanks to these efforts, sacrifice, and commitment of physicians, and also the active participation of our citizens, together we are able to respond to the further spread of COVID-19 and come up with outstanding care prevention practices also referred to by the international community. I hope today's event serves as an opportunity to share Korea's utilization of its DUR system and create a new global healthcare system post to COVID-19 filled with international cooperation and exchange. Once again, I would like to thank send my gratitude to everyone at Hira under the leadership of President Son Min Kim for putting together such a valuable event. I wish you all good health. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vice Minister Ryu, for your kind remarks despite your busy schedule. And we also have another congratulatory remark uh, delivered from Mr. Min Seok Kim, the chairman of the Health and Welfare Committee at the National Assembly. Please welcome him on screen. Good afternoon. I am Kim Min Seok, the chairman of Health and Welfare Committee of the National Assembly. Co-hosted by the Ministry of Health and Welfare and HERA, today we are celebrating the opening of the International Symposium and International Training Course. In the fight against COVID-19, many people from different sectors made sacrifices to protect the public. In the midst of the pandemic, HERA also played a critical role in so many ways. And we realized that HERA was committed to our daily lives in diverse ways. including setting up the right level of fee schedule for medical services and also laying the groundwork for the basic infrastructure of the healthcare system in Korea. Here as judgment, policies, regulations hold much significance. Not only today's main topic of DUR system, but also other areas Hira touches upon that we're not going to address today. I sincerely hope that Hira will continue to work proactively to enhance public health, the overall healthcare system, and even our international standing on the global stage. Once again, thank you all for making this event possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, National Assembly Member Kim, for your words of encouragement and, of course, your congratulatory message. And now, last but not least, Ms. Jung suk so of the National Assembly of the Republic of Korea has also sent us some congratulatory remarks. Please welcome her on the screen. It is a great pleasure to meet you all. I am so Jung suk so a valued member of the National Parliament who dreams of universal health for all Korean nationals. I'm sending my greetings from afar in a virtual manner in the midst of COVID-19. Congratulations on the opening of the 2021 HERA International Symposium and Training Course. 
I send my gratitude to President Sun Min Kim and all of the staff members of HERA for putting together such a meaningful event. In the midst of COVID-19 and in response to the pandemic, HERA has been receiving more and more attention from the international community about what it does so well and the so many accomplishments it made. HERA's medical big data is widely used by many research projects worldwide and its drug utilization review and international traveler information system as part of crisis management have been playing a pivotal role in keeping the public safe in light of the present healthcare crisis which are the kind of efforts that have been publicly recognized. For two consecutive years in 2019 and 2020, HERA received grade A for public organization management performance evaluation, and in 2020, it has been selected as an excellent public organization in terms of customer satisfaction. And all of this was only possible thanks to the members of HERA under the president, under the leadership of President Sun Min Kim, who have worked together towards the shared goal. This symposium is held in celebration of the 10-year anniversary of the adoption of the DUR system under the topic of DUR and ITS accomplishments and the role in responding to COVID-19. I am all the more confident that this event will provide a platform to share recent trends and discuss ways towards a more productive future as an international community. I also hope that this will serve as an opportunity for HERA to make meaningful contributions in achieving universal healthcare coverage and continue to play a central role in further developing the global healthcare system. I wish HERA all the best to prepare wisely to better learn to live with COVID-19, become more widely received by the public, and further grow and excel on the global stage. Once again, congratulations on the opening of the 2020 HERA International Symposium and Training Course. Stay healthy and continue the good work in healthcare data analysis and evaluation to become one step closer to universal health for all Korean individuals. Thank you very much. Thank you once again, National Assemblyman Ms. Seo. And now, ladies and gentlemen, before we close our opening ceremony, I'd like to invite our distinguished guests to take a commemorative photo all together. So I'd like to have a director, Executive Director Kim, as well as our distinguished guests in the front row, to please join me on stage for the group photo. Lecture. As I mentioned before, we have a keynote speaker who is overseas, and it is Dr. Nick Klazinga from the OECD. Allow me to introduce uh, Dr. Nick Klazinga for, for you. 
Uh, he is the strategic head of the Health Care Quality and Outcomes Program at the OECD in Paris since 2006. And present commitments include a visiting professorship at the Corvinus University in Budapest and the University of Toronto. And he's also the advisor to the WHO Euro. And his research group in Amsterdam is coordinating a large EU-funded program with 14 PhD fellows on performance intelligence. Today, he will be delivering a keynote speech titled, Using Drug Utilization Data as a Source for Quality Improvement, Reflections from the OECD. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome him on screen. Thank you for inviting me to present at this anniversary meeting of, uh, of the drug utilization program of HERA in, uh, in Korea. As was just said, my name is Nick Klaasinga. I'm strategic lead of the healthcare quality and program program at the OECD in Paris. And it's a pleasure to share with you some reflection about the use of drug utilization data as a, a source for quality improvement. But first, of course, I'd like to congratulate HERA with the 10 years anniversary of that drug utilization review program. Actually, I was in, uh, in Seoul 10 years ago when the OECD was asked to do a review on the quality of care in South Korea. And as part of that visit, <coughs> I had the pleasure of being in the then headquarters of HERA and visit the system, the computer actually physically, where real-time data on prescribing in the, 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 the Korean healthcare system were collected. So it, it's very nice to see that 10 years later, we're having this international symposium to really reflect on the experiences and the, the lessons that were learned. And <clears throat> I was impressed at that time by the fact that you have an, a real-time availability of prescribed uh, med medications and the potential of using that both prospectively and retrospectively to learn about rational use of medication. So what I will do in this presentation for your conference <clears throat> is basically share the perspective from the OECD as an international organization about the use and the utility of <clears throat> having this knowledge about prescribing data. And one of the things I try to <clears throat> bring forward is that, is that these data only have a meaning when they are turned into information and are actually used by people to change their behavior. And that's done on different levels in the healthcare system. That starts with the individual physician who gets feedback on his or her prescribing practices and learns that certain drugs could better not be prescribed or sees the, the long-term effects. Because you will never be able as an individual to learn from only your own experience on what the overall effects of drugs are. So getting this feedback is important. That's the first feedback circle. But another feedback loop can be on your, the level of your practice, the group of practitioners you, you work with together to see whether you could synchronize the, the prescribing practices. And even further, it could be in a regional or local network of different clinics and prescribers that evaluate systematically the use of their medication. So having feedback loops on the individual, the practice and the local level is essential if you want to add feedback loops on a national level, as is done with the drug utilization review program of, uh, <clears throat> of, of HERA. And it becomes even more <clears throat> distant if you try to learn from this data 
in, on an international level. Of course, my presentation will be about this international learning and using drug utilization data by comparing countries and hence trying to improve. But one of the main points I would like to make in this presentation is that all these feedback loops are important and should be in synergy. So I already addressed the unique character of HERA's drug utilization review program, which is now in place for, for 10 years. And as far as I know, there are not that many countries who have similar real-time availability of data. I'm familiar with the Medicaid program of drug, drug utilization review in the US and several European programs that set up the same thing of using the, the claims data to provide feedback. But HERA is rather unique in the, the directness of the data. And as you will discuss in your conference, that also proves to be very beneficial in a period like of a pandemic when you really want to have quick information of what's going on and how to react. The high level feedback loops I, I will discuss today are a few uh, case studies. I will share with you some of the experience of the OECD on working with, <clears throat> with antibiotics prescribing data. I will share with you the story about opioid use and how to use prescribing data to address that. I will use the case study of diabetes related medication. And more in general, I will <clears throat> tell the story on how data on prescribing and medication form an important part of our efforts to make healthcare more safe. So the relation between medication and patient safety. And at the end of my presentation, I'll come back to what I started off with, exploring the link of drug utilization data and quality improvements through the various feedback loops in the, in, in the healthcare system. But before starting with the first case study, let me just share with you the overall framework the OECD is using for summarizing data from countries on topics in healthcare. This is actually the framework that we use for building Health at a Glance, the biannual publication of the OECD that tries to summarize a lot of information on the performance of healthcare systems. And <clears throat> I'm happy to say that in November we will release the next version of it. But it's good to see that behind that lies a framework that really tries to link the different components of the system. So there's information about the health status, there's information about the risk factors, and when it comes on the actual contribution of healthcare <coughs> to the health, it looks at access to healthcare quality of health care, health expenditure and financing, resources and activities like workforce and, and, and the volume of activities. And we have specific sub sector analysis on, for example, pharma the pharmaceutical sector and aging. And all that should be interpreted in the context of the specific demographic, economic and social context of a country. So when I speak today only about drug utilization data that should be cost be reflected upon as part and parcel of the broader functioning of the of, of the healthcare system. So let me start <clears throat> with speaking about the rational antibiotic use. Of course it's not new to you <clears throat> that we try to rationalize antibiotic use by having guidelines and about prescribing of antibiotics in hospital care as well as in primary care in an outpatient patient settings. I'm sure Korea is familiar with lots of formularia, local guidelines and protocols that are used to address rational antibiotic use. That's the prescribing side. On the other hand, it has to do with, with expectations of the population. And here an important part is done by the health literacy of people. Do, is there a common understanding that antibiotics are no use when you have a viral infection? Or is there a huge demand 
by the population for antibiotics in situations where from an evidence-based perspective it's not really rational to provide those uh, those those drugs so um, we see that that there is a need to add to to this rational prescribing with national policies and antibiotics is one of the areas where this has really become a huge international topic mainly because we can't endlessly go on with prescribing antibiotics and neglecting the resistance patterns that are developing by the overuse so what the OECD is doing already I think for 15 years is asking countries to report the overall volume of their antibiotics and here you you see the data that were presented in 2019 but we try to monitor in the countries the overall volume of antibiotics that are prescribed and the percentage of that that are second line antibiotics meaning the ones that you should really <coughs> reserve to really severe cases because once we are we we develop a resistance against those antibiotics in our in our healthcare systems we are out of possibilities so apart from rational prescribing for the individual patients is it any use to give an antibiotic to this patient there is a broader societal problem of when we don't use it properly we run out of opportunities of using antibiotics in the future so <clears throat> in addition to the overall data on antibiotic use and you see some previous data from 2017 here of the data we get from Korea we also try to uh, <clears throat> to find the percentage of hospitalized patients that have at least one healthcare associated infection with bacteria iso isolated so basically we try to see what percentage of the isolated <clears throat> bacteria seen are resistant against the antibiotics here you see the, the prevalence of hospital associated infections and the small <coughs> diamond in black shows you the percentage of the tested um, <coughs> tests that showed that the antibiotics were resistant you see a different pattern but this of course is also important information to monitor <coughs> alongside the overall volume of antibiotics the, 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 the severity of the increase of, re, of resistance. The OECD has done a, a lot of work in the past six years on the impacts of at first at, at first reaction at, at first of the of the burden of, uh, of adverse reactions to, to the antibiotics over time. Here you see in the calculation of the health burden of infections due to bacteria with antimicrobial resistance compared to other communicable diseases. And you see that the, the burden of antimicrobial resistance, the big column on the, on the left, is almost twice as high as the burden in societies of influenza or tuberculosis or even HIV AIDS. That made it necessary to raise this also on a political level and <clears throat> actually the OECD has produced a series of reports um, on the request of the European Union but also on the request of the G20 for which the economic consequences of antimicrobial resistance and basically <clears throat> the, those reports tell the story that if you really take now preventive measures have a more rational use of antibiotics that is not only saving lives but it's also a sound economic investment because in the long run the economic costs of having a huge percentage of antimicrobial resistance and not being able to 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 to, to care for people will have huge economic consequences this table shows the results of one of those modeling exercises and it calculated for countries within the EU <clears throat> the number of lives that could be could be saved per year by implementing systematically 
the, 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 the preventive measures. And these preventive measures, of course, include, again, having the guidelines, having rational use of prescribing. And I'm making this point just to show that those drug utilization data on antibiotics are not just telling you what is good medicine for an individual patient, but they are part of a broader societal problem where we have to rationalize the use of a resource that in the long term won't be as effective as it is at the moment. So antibiotic use has become a point on the agendas of policymakers and even of presidents when they meet during the G20 and has been picked up as a major topic that should be addressed in, uh, in, in OECD countries. That's the story about antibiotics. Let me now move to the use of opioids. Here also, <clears throat> two years ago, the OECD released a report that tells how to address the problematic opioid use in OECD countries. This report was uh, written on the request of Canada that became as a country concerned when they saw the, <clears throat> the major problems that overuse of opioids was causing in the, in the United States. So this is another area where the OECD tries to <clears throat> collect data. And here you see, for example, a graph on the availability of analgesic opioids in two time periods. One of the messages here is that you see that, that in the, the rates for Korea are very low, which is positive, but you also see countries here where the rates are very high. And as I said, in, in the US, this is really labeled as a crisis, the opioid crisis. So that's why the OECD for all countries asks this kind of information. And we like with antibiotics, we like to see the overall volume of opioids that is prescribed. And here you see a, a list of these data just to help countries to get an idea where they are in their opioid use compared with, uh, with others. And of course, as you will find a graph in the report released in uh, 2019, we, we try to capture the opioid related deaths between 2011 and 2016. And, and you see the, the improvements that were made in the, in, in, in the, US, in the, no, the, the, the problems that still exist in the US. You also see that in some other countries, that might, this is not considered as a, as a major problem. But it just illustrates that rational use of opioids using drug utilization data to provide feedback on your prescribers and your system are key in keeping things within the limits of what is rational prescribing. For my third case study, I would like to refer to diabetes care. And <clears throat> here, the indicators of medication use are part of the broader story of how countries are dealing with diabetes. What you see here is a graph on <clears throat> diabetes-related hospital admissions. In essence, these are potentially avoidable hospital admissions. If you treat diabetes patients well in primary care and outpatient care, and they use the right medication, then <clears throat> the, the chances of them being admitted to a hospital in an unplanned way are, of course, minimized. But we see here that, of course, the overall and the situation is improving in the majority of the countries between 2012 and 2017, meaning that increasingly fewer patients with diabetes have an unplanned admission to the hospital. And, but you see that when I look at Korea in these data, it's still rel relatively high. So one of the factors <clears throat> that, that, that relates to appropriate diabetes care is, of course, the medication. And one of the tables that we present in our Health at a Glance publication is whether people with diabetes are prescribed the, the appropriate antihypertensive medications. Of course, you can do this when you have a good drug utilization review system in place, because on the one hand, you can 
take the list of diabetes medication, which is almost solely used for diabetes patients. And then you can see if for those patients in combination, what anti-hypertension drugs they are having. You see that that's <clears throat> overall, the picture lo uh, looks positive. Um, you see that that's for Korea, that, that there might be room for some improvement. So I'm really looking forward to seeing newer data to see whether the, the type of anti-hypertensive drugs that are given to people with diabetes are in, 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 in accordance with the, with, with, with the guidelines. Of course, this is only a small part of the overall story of monitoring diabetes. We also have the data on amputation rates and, and readmission rates, but overall, this is an, a use of drug, uh, <clears throat> drug utilization data that can be used internationally and where you can, can compare your country and your performance with, uh, with others. So, in addition to these three case studies on the use of looking at prescribing data on antibiotics, looking at prescribing data on opioids, and looking at prescribing data of antihypertensive drugs for patients with uh, diabetes, let me <coughs> share some general notions of the the utility of drug utilization review as a good component of patient safety. The OECD did a lot of work over the past 10 years on patient safety, and there are several reports, again used at, the, for example, the G20 conference, telling about the impacts of patient safety on the overall economy. Basically, when you, you see that one out of 10 hospital admissions is related to a patient safety incident, and you, you, you can calculate the overall economic impacts. And that is a very good reason to say we really should pay attention to safety in our healthcare systems. And of course, medication use is one of the leading reasons for adverse events. Of course, there are are many others. I, I saw some recent studies looking at outpatient care where the, the major factor was, was wrong diagnosis, but about 25% of the cases in those studies, which were done in the UK, was related to medication use. So <clears throat> medication use is one of the, the drivers of adverse events. And as you know, with your drug utilization review program in Korea, the database of the DER is one of the good sources to identify potential adverse events. I've been going over several papers that were published in the past 10 years over your uh, DOR program, and I was happy to see that especially in the papers that were published in the, the last years and that summarized the, the, the various studies, I, I see that your system is able to reduce the number of adverse events. Of course, that is a major function. And of course, while the percentages may seem small, the overall <clears throat> effect is very important of using these prescribing data as a real way <clears throat> to providing feedback to providers, institutes, regions, and the country as a whole on the potential adverse events in there. And as you've been doing from the beginning, you look at the drug-drug interactions, you look at drugs prescribed to people who are pregnant, and you look at specific drugs in, in, in age groups, like or elderly people, where they result in multimorbidity. That information is key in dealing with, uh, with, with, with patient safety. Because we still know that a substantial amount of hospital admissions is related to inappropriate medication use. Uh, I find it difficult to give a percentage there. I've seen studies that range from 4%, 4% up to 40%. I think in the Netherlands, the studies that have been performed about uh, medication use related hospital admissions end up with about 15%, but it's substantial. There's still a, a lot of hospital admissions, and I'm sure the same is the case in South Korea where hospital admission is related 
to inappropriate use of, uh, of medication. That means <clears throat> that it's rightly so to put focus on patient safety initiatives that are related to medication use. And that's the case in, in hospital care, but surely also <clears throat> in outpatient and primary care, where it's one of the main drivers that where the, the adverse events result in hospital admissions, but increasingly so in, in long-term care. So it would be very good to see over the full breadth of the system how to, <clears throat> how to tackle medication-related adverse events uh, and as a, as a topic of patient safety. So this is all to say that prescribing data are an important information source. And I put here the list of Tony Avery because he was one of the first already 10 years ago when you started with your program in the UK to identify a list of the drug-drug interactions that could be identified in the UK system. I've seen similar lists, of course, in, 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 in the US, and I know that that's that HERA over the years has refined their, their list also. So using prescribing data as an important source for information to see unwanted uh, combinations of drugs, drugs given to people who are pregnant that they shouldn't, and of course the drug use in specific uh, age groups, especially people above 65. And increasingly I see studies where it's not just everybody about 65, but also people about above 70, above 80, or even higher. So the link of multi-morbidity and multi-medication use and appropriate use in the elderly is surely an important topic to look at, especially in relation to, uh, to, yeah, uh, to inappropriate uh, hospital admissions. So I hope with this presentation, I gave you the idea that these data are extremely important. They can be used for patient safety, but they are part of the broader approaches in the system as a whole of, imp of improving safety. So it is good to, to reflect on how the data are used on different levels. Of course, they, how, in the end, it's important to know how are they used on the clinical level. This is a figure that USD uses in its safety reports and making clear that it should be a series of strategies that are really combined and address all the different components. But thinking this through from the perspective of medication use, I would say how are the <clears throat> drug utilization review data of HERA used on the clinical level? What are the, 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 the feedback loops there? How do people use this data? on a day-to-day, -day, well, not day-to-day, -day, but on a regular basis to reflect on their own prescribing patterns, on the prescribing patterns in their groups. And is there a an, 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 an mechanism, an, a regular meeting, where these data are systematically discussed? Of course, then there are the activities on the meso level of the healthcare system that has to do with the, the organizational involvement and the Infrastructure, I put here the infrastructure of the electronic health record system and clinical incident reporting. But an important part here is also how these data are linked to other databases. I will, I'm not addressing the, the, the benefits of data linkage in this presentation, but my colleague Jillian Odekirk will in another presentation uh, show you the advantages of enhanced data linkage between administrative data, mortality statistics, describing data, and electronic health records as a very good way to generate the information to put things like um, medication prescribing in, in a broader context, link, link it to clinical diagnosis, link it to the follow-up. And that, that capacity is an important aspect on how healthcare systems in the 21st century do, do their work. In that respect, Jillian will also mention that the OECD is presently doing a country review on South Korea on its data infrastructure. And that really looks at the capability 
of the healthcare system in South Korea to make these linkages and to optimize the use of existing data. And you've shown during the pandemic that several steps can really be made. I'm, I'm impressed with, by the way, for example, how HERA has opened up its clinical database for researchers from other countries to, to really learn from the impact of COVID. Just to make the point that when you look at the fundamentals, when you look at a national drug utilization review program, it isn't standing on itself. It is part of the broader data infrastructure and the broader infrastructure of reflection and learning. And it should be continuously considered as such. So <clears throat> to conclude my presentation on the use of drug utilization data for quality improvements, um, the points, I, points I, I want to make, main points at, are that dash, these data are not a standalone thing. These data are part of the broader data infrastructure in Korea, and that means that linking data on medication prescribing with clinical data, electronic health record data, mortality data, and administrative data is, is important. The OECD is also moving in that direction. We do a lot of work and, and actually one concrete area where we're working on indica indicators is in integrated care, where we're working with countries on indicators on chronic heart failure and stroke, where the data from where the administrative data from the hospital system, the prescribing data from the prescribing databases and the mortality data are combined. So we basically try to follow patients the whole pathway and, for example, see whether a person with chronic heart failure is on the one hand getting the right medication in time and on the other hand has readmissions, is stable and on a population level um, whether people die or don't die. So it, it's, it's research and development, but it's an attempt from an international organization to help countries start looking at pathways of care by really linking administrative data, mortality data, and prescribing data. And the second point that I <clears throat> try to bring forward is that all this data collection should be linked to the various feedback mechanisms. I showed you the feedback loops at the beginning on the level, level of the individual physician, the practice, the local networks or hospitals, and the country as a whole. But these things need to be linked together. So prescribing data have a direct link with uh, practice guidelines, protocols, performance indicators on different levels in the system, on health hospital and regional level, the performance of audit studies to see whether there is compliance with standards, and <clears throat> a lot of feedback systems, also, not just on a national level, but on the local level. Um, I'm just thinking about my own country, the Netherlands, where the, the, G, the, the groups of general practitioners in primary care on a regular basis reflect on utilization data. And that's facilitated also by the insurer who helps to collect the data. And there are also on a bi-monthly basis discussions between the pharmacists and the physicians on basically trying to, 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 to get a better grip on prescribing in, in outpatient care in, in, in hospital care and using the knowledge of the specialist, the general practitioner and the pharmacist to understand whether the, 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 <clears throat> the medication is used in a rational way. So overall, <clears throat> I'm again congratulate, congratulating Hira with 10 years of uh, drug utilization review. And I really hope you will have a productive conference trying to see that with the improvements made, you can go even further by linking it to the other strategies on, in your system for quality improvements. And as such, I will think it's, it's an important achievement after 10 years, but there is a big, big challenge ahead in the, in the coming 10 years. And I'm looking forward to, uh, to observe these developments. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you once again, uh, Dr. Klasinka, for the great, uh, insightful keynote lecture. He spoke about a comprehensive uh, case studies of various different drug utilizations and also provided some recommendations for Korea's HERA for the next 10 years. So thank you very much once again for your insight. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we'll move on to our sessions. And first, I would like to invite Mr. Chosu Kim, uh, the Drug Utilization Review Department, who will present on a decade of accomplishments on DUR, Drug Utility Review. Please welcome him on screen. Hello everyone, I am Chol Su Kim, Deputy Minister of Hira DUR Department. I really think, thank everyone for participating the 2021 Hira International Symposium despite the difficult situation due to COVID-19. My theme of the presentation today is the role of DUR in Korea and its accomplishments and the examples of Korean, prevention, Korean preventive measures leveraging DUR against COVID-19. This is the table of contents. There will be simple introductions about Korean National Health Insurance Program and main roles of HERA, which will be followed by accomplishments made during 10 years and Korean preventive measures based on it. First, I will begin with the Korean National Health Insurance Program and main role of HERA. Korean NHA is one of the representative social insurance programs that is operating to secure improvement in public health and social security. Main characteristics of NHI include differentiated level of premium in proportion to income and property, equal benefit for all subscribers, and fee-for-service payment system. Under the supervision of Ministry of Health and Welfare, NHI is operated by two agencies. HERA is in charge of claims review and quality assessment, and National Health Insurance Service manages the insured, which are subscribers. Next part is about the management and operation system of National Health Insurance. NHI program is operated by two agencies. Uh, HERA is in charge of claims review and quality assessment and National Health Insurance Service, NHIS, manages subscribers and eligibility. The insured receive healthcare services from any providers in the nation and the providers are reimbursed after HERA conducts review and assessment on their claim. This slide explains the main roles and functions of HERA. HERA is a special public corporation and a public institution that was established in July 2000 based on the National Health Insurance Act. It is composed of about 4,000 healthcare professionals. It is also equipped with ICT infrastructure such as DUR, ITS, healthcare resource management system, healthcare big data system, and Korea Pharmaceutical Information Service, KPIS. HERA's main functions are claims review and quality assessment. Other responsibilities include policy support by conducting coverage listing of treatment, drugs, resources, and standard setting, etc. Also, HERA provides drug information through DUR, manages healthcare resources and big data, and runs international cooperation projects. Next part is about the 10-year history of DUR and the accomplishments. DUR is a supporting system to guarantee safe use of drug. 
DUR is the representative healthcare safety net and core infrastructure of HERA that is facilitating a safe environment for safe use of drug. The mission of DUR is to prevent unsafe and inappropriate use of drugs to protect the public from drug adverse effect. To achieve this, DUR provides safety information of respective drugs in real time when doctors and pharmacists prescribe and dispense medicine. Target drugs of DUR are about 75,000 items distributed by all providers and pharmacists across the nation. Main review features for pre-inspection include contraindication, age precaution, pregnancy precaution, safety-related caution, and dose and administration period caution. Follow-up monitoring are made for drugs that may be abused, such as narcotics. This slide is about the DUR review process, and it's quite self-explanatory. As shown in the screen, DUR system is built to provide drug safety information, such as contraindication, at the point of prescription and dispensing on a real-time basis. When the physician transmits prescription data to HERA, HERA provides inspection results and the physician applies the results to finalize the prescription and issue it. After prescription is finalized, the data is collected and saved by HERA in the form of database. The same process is applied for pharmacists when they dispense drugs based on the prescription. Next part is the progress of DUR since its implementation. At its inception in 2003, DUR was designed as a policy alternative to build a preventive system against drug adverse effect. In 2008, a DUR pilot was implemented for within one prescription review and another pilot in 2009 resulting in the implementation of the current format in 2010 nationwide. The review standards gradually expanded every year, including therapeutic duplication, senior precaution, and a legal basis to make DUR review mandatory was introduced in 2015 for doctors and nurses. In particular, since the MERS outbreak in 2015 to current COVID-19 pandemic, DUR has provided data of entrants from overseas and confirmed cases to providers and authorities. Now I'd like to talk about the achievements of here, uh, DUR. First, it is providing safe drug use information to providers and to public in real time to foster environment that ensures a safe and appropriate use of drugs. If you look at the social cost, although it might differ upon years, the cost-saving effect thanks to DUR amounted to 79.7 7, billion Korean won in 2019 and 92.3 billion in 2020, which is quite significant. Also, the real-time data accumulated by DUR inspections are utilized as important big data when establishing healthcare policies that may promote public health and safe drug use. On another note, there have been supports to the Kingdom of Bahrain to implement Korean DUR system to their Bahrain National Integrated Drug Management Platform as a part of Korea Bahrain NHI project. And now there are supports for establishment of ASEAN Infectious Disease Response e-government cloud system to promote infectious disease responsibility of ASEAN countries. Next, 
I'd like to talk about the statistics that show the accomplishments of DUR. First, the participation rate of providers to DUR inspection is 99.4% in 2020, which is a 71.8% point raise compared to 27.6% in 2011. The information provided to DUR was 140 million cases in 2020, which means 55% point uplift from 89 million cases in 2016. As a result, the information provided for prevention of unsafe use of drug saved 310.8 billion Korean won in pharmaceutical expenditure between 2016 to 2020. Let me briefly touch upon some additional services that are based on DUR. Check My Medication at a Glance service provides individuals' medication history for one year. And to control and prevent spread of COVID-19 and other infectious diseases, overseas travel records are provided to healthcare providers through DUR and ITS. In addition, to facilitate monitoring of abnormal reaction to vaccine and epidemiological investigation, lists of inoculators are, and treatment information of patients are sent to KDCA and providers. Additionally, suspended drug data are shared with providers real-time to block the use immediately and prevent safety-related accidents. Let me turn to the future direction for DUR. Over the past 10 years, we've worked hard to complement the system, but there are still room for improvement. We need more future-oriented development policies and plans. There are three main points to consider. First, an expansion to inclusive drug use management is necessary. Currently, DUR focuses on pre-inspection and information provision, but in the future, advancements to integrated assessment and management of inappropriate drug use that can encompass safety, quality, and cost is needed. Second, we need not only the administration of drugs, but also groundwork for assessment of safety, quality, and cost to measure cost and effect. In other words, we need to build a patient unit database of medication and treatment, rather than service type unit database like prescri prescription and dispensing. Lastly, DUR standards should be improved to include personal traits of patients and expand its subject to enable provision of customized DUR information. Hirara will come up with solutions to secure operation of DUR as the core infrastructure of public health care safety net. Next part is about the Korean quarantine and prevention measures based on DUR. Currently, Korea is operating the Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasures Headquarters, CDSCHQ, which was the Prime Minister as head and pan-governmental efforts are made to realize disinfection. On the CDSCHQ, there are uh, Central Disease Control Headquarters and Central Disaster Management Headquarters. Next is the current status of infectious disease information provision of DUR. Related to disease like MERS and COVID-19, information of 4 million entrants were provided annually, and for COVID-19, about 30 million cases of entrants and vaccine receivers were provided between 2020 to 2021. ITS system enabled preemptive responses like pre-inspection and quarantine of suspected cases, and information provision of vaccine inoculators enabled quick monitoring and epidemiological investigation to detect abnormal vaccine reaction. 
Lastly, I will explain about how HERA respond to infectious disease uh, utilizing DUR system. Since the outbreak of COVID-19 in January 2020, infection prevention in healthcare provider facility was the top priority task for HERA and the quarantine authorities. Fortunately, HERA already had response competence and experience accumulated during MERS outbreak of 2015, along with infrastructure like DUR and ITS. Thanks to DUR and ITS, could, we could offer the nationwide real-time information with healthcare providers and pharmacies. Korea could respond swiftly with preventive measures, such as providing entrance data from countries of high risk, early discovery of suspected cases, contact tracing, epidemiological investigation, vaccine monitoring, information of abnormal reactions. That was my introduction of DUR service of HERA. There are many challenges ahead, including pandemic and variants, and there is a long way to go until we reach living with COVID and post-COVID era. Still, I hope that we can remain positive until the day comes. I'd like to thank everyone for your presence and participation. Thank you. Thank you once again, Mr. Kim, for that great uh, extensive presentation. Looking at the 10 years of history of our proud DUR system, as well as some of the tasks that remain ahead of us. And now uh, moving on to our next speaker. The uh, next speaker is Professor Pyeongju Park of Seoul National University. And allow me to introduce our speaker to you. Uh, Professor Pyeongju Park, uh, founded the Korean Society for Patient Safety in January of 2015, and also served as the first and second president from January 2015 to December of 2018. He also served as the president of the Korean Society for Preventative Medicine from 2017 to 2018, as well as the 17th and 18th president of the Korea Public Health Association from 2014 to 2018. 2020. Today, he will be delivering a presentation titled From a Pharmacovigilance System to the DUR System in Korea. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome him on screen. Thank you for your kind introduction. Today, I would like to take this opportunity to, to walk you through the development of Korea's drug utilization management system under the topic of pharmacovigilance system in Korea's DUR system. WHO defines pharmacovigilance as the science and activities relating to the detection assessment, understanding, and prevention of adverse effects or any other drug-related problem. These pharmacovigilance activities continue throughout the product life cycle. Let me introduce the drug safety-related governmental organizations of Korea. In 1948, the Ministry of Health and Welfare was established to protect public health and safety. And in 1988, the Food and the Korea Food and Drug Administration was formed for drug approval and management of drug safety purposes before it was promoted to the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety, MFDS, in 2013. In 2004, Korea Center for Disease Control was made to ensure vaccine safety. However, with the outbreak of COVID-19, it was promoted to the Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency in 2020. 
deservedly reflecting the significance of vaccination and disease prevention. In the year 2000, HERA Health Insurance Review Assessment Service was separated from the National Health in Insurance Service, NHIS, and in 2009, National Evidence-Based Healthcare Collaborating Agency, NECA, was founded, contributing to health and health-based healthcare system since its inception. In 2012, Korea Institute of Drug Safety and Risk Management, KIDS, was established under MFDS with the goal to provide evidence regarding drug safety and risk management. Prior to 2010, there were three main systems for pharmacovigilance, re-evaluation of drugs, spontaneous ADR reporting, and re-examination of drugs. The re-evaluation of drugs system was intended to evaluation or to evaluate the safety and validity once again of approved drugs based on the up-to-date scientific knowledge. It was implemented in three phases until 2017 since its adoption in 1977. Spontaneous ADR reporting system was introduced in 1988 requiring not only cl clinicians but pharmacists and also the public to voluntarily report adverse drug reactions or ADRs. Korea joined the World Health Organization Program for International ADR Monitoring, the WHO-UMC, in 1992. However, the number of reported ADRs were very low and very few for more than a decade since introduction. Therefore, in order to activate participation of voluntary reporting of ADRs, KFDA designated three teaching hospitals as regional pharmacovigilance centers, RPV, and has expended designation to six in 2007 and nine in 2008. With the increase of designated RPV centers, more voluntary ADRs were reported, which is why KFDA founded the Pharmacovigilance Research Network, PVNet, with the designation of 15 RPVCs. The PVNet was to activate spontaneous ADR reporting, conduct P research, educate and promote drug safety, and engage in international collaboration for pharmacovigilance. In 2012, Korea Institute of Drug Safety and Risk Management, KIDS, was newly founded, making the total number of designated RPVCs to 20. The institute was created under a mission to collect, analyze, evaluate, and manage ADR data and perform causality assessment on received ADRs, also to develop drug utilization review criteria to distribute guidelines to HERA, and last but not least, to provide a public service regarding drug safety education and information. So this is the organization structure of KIDS. There are five teams in operation. In the early stages, there was the Office of Drug Safety Information Number 1, and Office of Drug Safety Information Number 2, Office of Pharmacoepidemiology, Office for DUR Information, and Office for Business Administration. Since its inception, the number of regional pharmacovigilance centers in Korea has increased from 22 uh, 2022 27 and then to 28 in 2020, ensuring nationwide service. A number of changes have been made to the ADR reporting system as well. When the system was initially adopted in 1988, reporting was done via hard copy or fax. However, with the opening of the Easy Drug website in 2000, online ADR reporting became available. In 2009, the PVNet website for ADR reporting was launched, and in October 2012, the official website of KIDS went live. In August 2014, the system expanded to also include foreign ADR reports as well. Ever since the introduction of spontaneous ADR system in 1988, as shown in the graph, the number of ADR reports have been on the rise up to 2005, however, in a very sluggish manner. 
However, since the designation of RPVCs from 2006, the reported cases went up exponentially. More than 2 million cases have been reported to present, making Korea the highest per million reporter of ADRs to WHO. In 2013, Korea Institute of Drug Safety and Risk Management adopted Narcotics Information Monitoring System, also known as NIMS, and in 2014 amended the Pharmaceutical Affairs Act for enforcement of relief of injury from adverse drug reactions. Also in 2013, introduced the Drug Epidemiological Investigators and started to educate safety control managers at pharmaceutical companies who are responsible for pharmacovigilance of their drugs. And in 2015, launched a pilot program of APEC Pharmacovigilance COE Center of Excellence. In 2017, the marketing approval was renewed in an effort to further develop the re-evaluation system of drugs to manage drug products on a regular five-year basis and systemically renew the validity of drugs and to ensure drug safety. Also, the risk management plan has been introduced for comprehensive medicinal product safety. for comprehensive medicinal product safety control protocol, including methods of relieving risk determined by the government. The risk management plan is a very comprehensive system to ensure drug safety that is implemented from the clinical stage in stage one, two, three, four to novel drug approval. Even after market approval, risk planning activities are performed for additional revision and complementation up to phase four. This system required pharmaceutical companies in August 2014 to mandatorily report on their own drugs. And the application scope has been extended by stage. In 2015, it was applicable to novel and orphan drugs. In 2016, to drugs with different active pharmaceutical ingredients. And in 2017, to drugs with different route of administration from the approved products. And in 2018, to drugs with label extension from the approved products. In order to improve the re-examination system, a plan to enhance the post-marketing surveillance system was implemented. By doing so, in 2020, the overlapping areas of RMP and re-examination system was solved. And this year, methods to improve efficiency of RMP regulation was introduced. In 2022, it is planned to unifies, unify the post-marketing surveillance system to RMP. So this is how we were able to come up with our own ADR monitoring system. And at the center of these systems is KIDS under MFDS to receive ADR reports from patients and pharmaceutical companies, analyze data in the databases, and if necessary, can conduct related analysis on HERA's evaluation and analysis data, statistic offices, morality figures, hospital EMI data, and the National Cancer Center's registered cancer data, which can be used to report to MFDS that will then engage in risk communication and perform risk management policies accordingly. In recognition of these efforts, KIDS won the honor of the United Arab Emirates Health Foundation Prize by WHO in 2018. Let me now turn to the DUR system in Korea. DUR is a structured 
ongoing initiatives that interpret patterns of drug use in relation to predetermined criteria in an attempt to prevent or minimize inappropriate prescribing. Uh, poly, pharmacy, poly pharmacy has been a persistent critical issue for the elderly in Korea. Due to the rapid aging trend in the society, elderly population is on the rise. And in nature, the elderly suffer from multiple chronic diseases, including high blood pressure and diabetes, which force them to resort to polypharmacy. However, even so, we need to take a more patient-oriented approach to find ways to minimize adverse effects. This table exemplifies that Korea's polypharmacy status is significantly severe compared to countries worldwide. And this is according to a study conducted in around 2010. Now let me move on to the DUR adoption history of Korea. In the late 1980s, the introduction of the concept was made in Korea but not particularly acted on until 2003 when by the National Assembly audit on the Ministry of Health and Welfare, it was pointed out that there is a serious drug prescription problem in the nation, which gave birth to the first DUE, a DUR committee under the ministry. Practical dialogue discussing the introduction of the DUR system has been jump-started in drug-drug interaction and age contraindicated drugs were also listed in the process as well. In September 2005, the DUR operation was transferred to MFDS, which in 2006 developed pregnancy contraindicated drugs, drug-drug interaction, and age contraindicated drugs as well. In December 2010, HERA launched a nationwide DUR system. And in April 2012, the KIDS DUR office started to develop DUI criteria and share it with HERA. However, the DUR system in the early stages was not received well by clinicians that initially thought that the DUR is an invasion of clinicians' rights, so they were against it because the physicians thought that it would be an invasion of clinicians' rights on medical treatment. It will force them to provide uniform treatment and it can be taken advantage of to save medical expenses. However, led by the Gyeonggi-do Medical Association, who supported the cause and announced to participate, stirring up some controversy in the industry. After a pilot project conducted by the Ministry of Health and Welfare, and Hira started to operate the DUR system in 2010, and after many years of implementation, physicians realized that the positive effect of the system is big for themselves and also for patients. To ensure a successful DUR system, intergovernmental agency collaboration is key. The Ministry of Health and Welfare and the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety devise policies and then enforce them acting as intelligence agencies, whereas under the umbrella of the Ministry of Health and Wel Welfare, HERA became the public organization managing the DUR system. And Korea Institute of Drug Safety and Risk Management under MFDS develops and disseminates DUR criterion as well as performing D DUR evaluation and analysis. There are three criteria for prioritization, prioritization for DUR target drug selection. Number one, drugs with known safety issues. Number two, based on claims, DB frequently prescribed drugs. 
number three, newly marketed drugs. To look at drug-drug interaction, age contraindication, pregnancy contraindication, therapeutic duplication, therapeutic dosage and duration range, and so on. Then what and how is DUI criterion produced? We start from literature review. We analyze local drug labels as well as foreign drug labels. We look into pharmacopoeia, drug-related databases and articles. We also look into textbooks and clinical guidelines. And in terms of analysis of the current status, we look at adverse drug reaction repos in KSRS database and patterns of current drug use in HERA databases are investigated. Based on this DUR criterion draft is created to be further reviewed by the Clinical Advisory Committee. This is how the DUR criteria is developed after comprehensive evaluation and which is why how Korea was able to adopt the nationwide DUR system. As can be seen from the slide, it is a concurrent DUR system. If a patient is to visit a hospital or a clinic, after examination and prescription from the physician, the data will be submitted to the HERA server in real time. And then the HERA server will also previously have previously prescribed data prior to this visit. Through interconnected search availability of data, once drug-drug interaction, age contraindication, pregnancy contraindication, and so far are identified, an alert window will be sent out to the prescriber in real time, which will be then checked by the clinician to either change the drug or prescribe the particular reason for prescription in the system to proceed to the next step. Once the patient brings the prescription to the pharmacy, once again for dispensing, HERA server would be called to receive real-time feedback. And if an issue is to be detected once again, an alert will be sent out to the DUR window. If pharma pharmacovigilance is to manage ADR after drug use, pharmacoprevention is to review the possible ADR in the prescription sa stage so that if necessary, changes can be made as part of ADR preventive measures. I believe that pharmacovigilance and par pharmacoprevention together can indeed keep our patients safe. The effect of the DUR system since its adoption is, however, not consistent. In 2012, Korea applied age contraindication for quinolone below 18 years old and applied age contraindication of methephendiate below 5 years old. Also can be seen quinolone prescription to below 18 years old dramatically dropped. However, even with the one year of age contraindication of methylphendiate below five years old application. The prescription pattern did not change, but even increased, which is an exemplification of the ineffectiveness of the DUR system. Depending on the drug sample, effects can vary. 
which is why we should further analyze the effects of the system in detail and come up with measures to respond to potential issues. There have been some issues raised to the current DR system since its adoption in 2010. So 11 years have passed since adoption. It has been reported that clinicians are experiencing alert fatigue to, to, uh, to the extent of some clinicians even disregarding alerts. Because, as mentioned, in some part it's due to alert fatigue, but it's also because prescription change after the alert is not mandatory but optional. Also, the DUR system is not able to solve the alerted problem specifically due to the lack of patient information. Because it's not like the patient information is all in the DR system in the HERA server, and it's not like the program is developed, which gives room for development moving forward. And for the DR system to be successful, clinician and pharmacist communication is critical, but it is not also reflective of the reality. So let me now share some suggestions to further improve the DUR system. More helpful DUR information is necessary to solve alerted cases. Improvement on the IT system is also necessary and to make legal grounds for exchanging PX information between medical care facilities is also key. Also, linking Kira systems and the system of KIDS to prevent duplicated ADR reporting as well. Also, policy development for active post-DUR monitoring would be helpful. Also, to relieve or make exceptions of privacy protection law would also be something that should be considered in educating clinicians and pharmacists of the DUR system and promotion towards the public would also be critical. In addition, providing incentives for active participants in the DUR program should also be considered. Therefore, to further develop the DUR system, Active collaboration between HERA and KIDS is key and should try to raise awareness and support from both physicians and the public as well. Now I would like to take this opportunity to walk you through the drug safety related changes in a summary, re-evaluation re -evaluation of drug system was adopted in 1977. In 1988, spontaneous ADR reporting system was introduced. In 1995, the re-examination of drugs was implemented, and from year 2000, web-based ADR reporting was serviced. From 2004, mandatory reporting within uh, mandated, uh, w which was mandated for manufacturers and pharmacists, and as of 2006, designation of regional PV centers kicked off. In 2007, mandatory appointment of qualified person for pharmacovigilance at pharmaceutical companies was mandated. In December 2010, the Nationwide Drug Utilization Review, Review Service was launched by HERA. In 2012, KIDS was established taking on a lot of responsibilities and as of 2014, foreign ADR reports started to be collected. In 2013, the ADR relief system was executed and the integrated narcotic system was launched as well. As of August 2014, 
the risk management plan system has been implemented, and in 2017, the renewal of marketing approval was adopted. The PMS improvement plan was devised in 2020, and in next year, 2022, the unified risk management plan will be launched. If we take a look at the Korean drug safety management system, the reevaluation of drug system has been upgraded to the renewal of marketing approval in 40 years, and the spontaneous ADR reporting system has been in operation to present. The reexamination of drug system that was adopted in 1995 has been integrated with the RMP system launched in 2014 and will become the unified RMP system as of next year. Since its introduction in 2010, the DUR system has been up and running and evolving over time. This concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I'm confident that today's symposium will serve as an opportunity to reflect on our DUR system, review Korea's drug utilization system together, and learn and improve from overseas cases to create a momentum in improving patient safety and a turning point for all of us to become even healthier. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Park, for that comprehensive presentation looking at the evolution of the drug safety regulatory changes of South Korea and, of course, some of the suggestions for the betterment of future development of the DUR system. Thank you once again, and I believe that it is now time for us to take a very short break. And after the break, we will resume with our next guest, Ms. Jillian Oderkirk from the OECD, who will be speaking about the real-time healthcare data in OECD countries. For our online participants, please do not go anywhere. Remember to stay online, and we will see you in just about 20 minutes. Thank you very much.
Thank you for returning uh, to our afternoon session, and I hope that you enjoyed the break. And as I promised before taking the break, I will now introduce to you our next speaker. Our next speaker is Ms. Jillian Oderkirk of the OECD, and she is a senior health economist in the health division of the OECD, and she studies the OECD country's progress in advancing national health information infrastructure including the development of electronic health record systems. And prior to joining the OECD, she was the director of the Health Analysis Division at Statistics Canada. Today, Mr. Uh, Ms. Odekirk will be speaking on the real-time healthcare data in OECD countries. Please welcome her on the screen. much for inviting me to the HERA International Symposium to speak about real-time healthcare data in OECD countries. The OECD has been working over the past 10 years to support countries in strengthening their health data infrastructure and the governance of health data. We developed a legal instrument called the Council Recommendation on Health Data Governance that asks all countries to develop a national health data governance framework that would allow for data to be developed, to be accessed, to be shared and used while protecting individuals' privacy and health data security. And we're now in the process of monitoring how uh, that for those frameworks are being developed and implemented in practice. And that's some of the data that I'm going to show you today. And we're also working with individual countries one-on-one -on -one to strengthen health information systems. Uh, and I'm very pleased that we're working right now with Korea on such a country review. And uh, we hope to be able to, to bring forward some helpful policy recommendations to take what is a, a very strong health information system and, and really make it uh, even more powerful for the 21st century. So why would we want to develop real world evidence about medications? Why do we want real world data about real patients um, and their healthcare experiences and their outcomes? Well, we want that real world evidence to support health technology assessment and the post-market surveillance and really safety monitoring of drugs in the real world um, to be more efficient about selecting clinical trial cohorts and add real world data to follow up their progress, to have information to guide our decisions about reimbursing drugs and pricing drugs, to develop really good clinical care guidelines for clinicians and to evaluate whether those guidelines are actually being followed. And as the Korean system with the JIR program is showing, you can give real-time guidance when clinicians are prescribing medications and pharmacists are dispensing medications to take the right decisions to preserve patient safety. And you could even take that a level further and you could develop the data to provide real-time decision support tools for clinicians about um, treatment pathways and prescribing that's tailored to the patient's needs. So if we wanted to have really good real world drug safety information, it would have four main components to it. It would have information at the level of patients about the medications that they are consuming, including the dosage of those medications. It would have patient level information about healthcare utilization. It would have patient level information about the outcomes for patients from following those treatments. Are they getting better? Do they have worse outcomes? Have they died? Mortality data. And it would also give us important characteristics of patients, sociodemographic characteristics, factors in their environment that might affect their outcomes. And it should have patient level information 
about diagnostic and clinical tests and diagnosis and the results so that we understand the progress of patients and the treatment that they have been given. So if we want to have all that kind of information, it, it makes a difference where the data on prescription medicines comes from to develop national health data. So as you can see in this chart, in most countries, data are extracted automatically from electronic claim or billing, or billing records. And it is claims data that uh, supports the Korean prescription medicines information. But we also have a large group of countries that are developing their national prescription medications data from electronic clinical health records. So they have a national EHR system and they're able to extract data from that system. So they're getting the more detailed clinical information into their prescription medicines database or registry. And then we have uh, in Finland, where as part of the EHR system, they have an e-prescriptions depository. They extract the data directly from there. Um, we still have countries that are working with paper records. And in the case of the United States of a highly fragmented health system, their national data depends still on a survey. It also makes a difference if you're able to link your patient level data about prescription medications to other data so that you can follow the pathway of care and you can observe the outcomes for patients. So we have a fairly large group of countries that are able to routinely link their national prescription medications information that's available at a patient level to their patient level hospital and patient data. We also have uh, fairly uh, good sized groups that are able to link to mortality data, emergency care data, mental hospital inpatient data, and formal long-term care data. So this is a busy chart, but what it's showing is that um, while many countries are linking healthcare data and healthcare data and mortality data, uh, fewer countries are actually linking to contextual data that could provide more information to understand uh, outcomes for vulnerable populations. So the, the best sources of data for understanding these background characteristics of the population are this census information and pop or a, a population registry if uh, your country doesn't have a census. And uh, well, we have some countries that are, are building these capabilities, um, it, they're certainly not as strong as they could be. And there was a, you know, an excellent example um, in the United Kingdom from the Office of National Statistics, where they, because they've been able to routinely link healthcare data and census of population data, They've been able to do this quite quickly to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and really identify from having done that vulnerable populations in terms of risk of developing the disease or access to care to treat the disease or access to vaccination. So this is an area to expand further uh, in, among OECD countries. Uh, just to highlight uh, particular progress in the Nordic region where there's robust and has been for, for many years capacity to link across different types of databases to create uh, these more developed sources of information for drug safety. Um, you can see the Nordic prescription databases are linked to health registries but also other sources of data like surveys, biobanks, clinical records, and to that important background information coming from population registries. 
Korea really stands out for being among a very small group of OECD countries with national health data in real time. So you can see at the top of this chart for prescription medicines data, there are only seven countries where the records in the data set are no more than a week um, between when they were first collected and when they're available for analysis. There's also eight countries that have real-time primary care data. And then for other types of data, there's very few countries that have developed that capability. Now, this data was um, measured just before the pandemic hit. And as a result of of experiencing the pandemic, countries are now reporting to the OECD that they've made some uh, significant improvements in the timeliness of data, particularly data directly related to COVID patients in terms of hospitalizations, but also particularly mortality. So in this chart, there's only two countries with real-time mortality data, but this is now expanded to eight countries so, you know, in a very, very short period of time, um, difficulties with national health data have been, have been really addressed in an accelerated way um, and really sets a new tone for, for where we will build from and, and what we can do going forward. So uh, countries have been working on uh, the power that they can gain from extracting clinical data from national electronic health record systems. And this capability uh, is an area for uh, much greater development uh, in Korea. But just to share um, progress in other countries, um, you can see there's 16 countries that are uh, using this clinical data now routinely for public health monitoring. 12 countries for monitoring patient safety, uh, 10 for monitoring health system performance and extracting data for medical and healthcare research. And there's also small groups of countries that are applying data mining, uh, predictive analytic techniques, and that are linking data in the HRs with genomic environmental and other contextual data. Uh, we have a large number of countries that are reporting the progress they're making in improving clinical data as an information resource. So 23 countries have joined one or more collaborative efforts, which are multi-country efforts to develop standards for health data terminology and exchange. And countries are also working uh, within their own jurisdictions on policies and projects to improve health data interoperability. And a particularly interesting new development is we've got 17 countries that are adopting uh, HL7 fire standards. So we're starting to see some convergence uh, in the global community around health data standards. And uh, many countries indicate that going through the pandemic has accelerated the development of their electronic health record systems. Just to shine a spotlight for a moment on uh, the United States effort of their federal a drug administration and their Sentinel system. So it's a privacy preserving distributed network based on a common data model with data from medical records and external registries. And it helps to provide real world evidence for all of those um, good ends that uh, we were discussing earlier. And I, I wanted to, to mention it um, it's not uh, uh, providing the full national picture in the United States uh, for drug safety. And you recall earlier, it, their main source of data is still from the uh, Medicare beneficiary survey. But for a growing number of healthcare organizations and, and um, many millions of patient 
uh, records uh, this sentinel system is developing and it has some similarities to developments in Korea. So this slide uh, was presented at a workshop uh, given by the OECD looking at um, best practices in health data governance. And uh, it, I think it shows very nicely the, the development in Korea uh, through uh, a global collaborative research project called Odyssey, the availability in a secure manner of linked data from HERA and from the Korean uh, Disease Control Agency um, and from other organizations to create uh, a, a database that was refreshed uh, in near real time, very current data on COVID-19 patients. And then the data was available to a research community through a distributed network so that there was uh, uh, the ability for researchers to query patient level data without violating the privacy of that data because the data never traveled outside of Korea and the researchers were submitting um, code and programs to be run against the data uh, but the researchers were not uh, working hands-on with the microdata uh, and this is how these distributed uh, and federated networks uh, operate. And so this is a very exciting development and how it, how it uh, really works or the backbone of this method is that the data are coded to a globally agreed common data model. So similar for the uh, US FDA Sentinel uh, surveillance initiative shown on the last slide, which also has a common data model that all of the participating organizations adhere to so that the data is coherent. The same thing is true for this uh, Odyssey project and this common data model called OMA. So this initiative in Korea that was really geared for COVID-19 research has great potential to provide a real-time or near real-time uh, data surveillance tool like FDA Sent Sentinel in the Korean context, but better than FDA Sentinel because this can cover the whole population. So there's a, a huge opportunity for uh, meeting all those really interesting objectives for real-world evidence um, in Korea by leveraging on some of these new developments that were made during COVID-19. So let's just recap uh, some of these expansion possibilities for Korea to consider. Um, it starts with what's available uh, for the DER system and for pharmaceutical data at the national level in Korea. Um, can there be the extension to the more clinical variables so that more is known about the dosage of prescription medicines and about um, diagnostic and test results for patients? And can there be more linkage to other data sets that will bring in population characteristics, environmental data, uh, eventually even genomic data to really enhance the ability of that uh, pharmaceutical data to really contribute to um, innovation, drug discovery, personalized medicine, evaluation of medicines, and how much more could the data within such a system um, be available in real time or near real time? There's, there's a lot uh, already developed in that direction in Korea and there's just a few more aspects of the data that could be uh, enhanced to be more timely. And then, you know, if the investment that Korea has already been making in coding data to the OMA common data model and in developing the DER system itself, then could this sentinel surveillance <laughs> 
type system for Korea uh, really be a possibility. So just to conclude this presentation by saying that Korea is already doing really well compared to other OECD countries in terms of health data availability, maturity and use, and also health data set governance. This slide just summarizes what uh, countries who have had the most success in developing a strong health information system have done to get there. And many of these elements are in place in Korea and there are others that could be strengthened further. And we look forward to continued discussions with, with Korea as we develop uh, uh, the recommendations from our review of the health information system. And just to conclude again with congratulations on the development of the real-time data and the decision support tool that the DUR system has brought to uh, improving drug safety in Korea. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Odekirk, for the great presentation. I believe that it was a great opportunity for us to look at the different variances uh, among the OECD countries and, of course, get tips on how uh, Korea can better its services. And moving on, we also have another speaker from overseas. Our next speaker is Professor Libby Ruckhead from the University of South Australia. And today she will be talking about drug utilization review opportunities and future directions, speaking on reflections from Australia. And just to give you a little bit of background on our speaker, her expertise includes pharmacy, behavioral science, epidemiology, and public policy with a research focus uh, to improve the use of medicines. She also served as an advisor to the World Health Organization on pharmaceutical systems, medicines, pricing, and utilization. With that, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome her on screen. I'm Libby Ruffhead from the Quality Use of Medicines and Pharmacy Research Centre at the University of South Australia and I'm delighted to be here today to give you some reflections from Australia on drug utilisation review, opportunities and future directions. I want to thank the organisers for in the invitation to speak today and be on, to say I'm honoured to be here with you all. I want to congratulate you on the 10-year anniversary of HERA the Drug Utilisation Review System. It's a system that I often talk about around the world and say we all need a system like Korea. It's world leading and I know that many of us can learn from what the good work that you do. I've been working on drug utilisation review and research to support Australian pharmaceutical policy since 1995. It started when I began evaluating Australia's national strategy for quality use of medicines in 1995. I've been a member of the Australian Drug Utilisation Subcommittee of our Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee since 2001 and I'm still a member today. And I run the Veterans Medicines Advice and Therapeutics Education Services Program, which is a data-driven program to improve veteran health care. So today I want to highlight how we use drug utilisation review to support listings and use of medicines on the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme. And I also want to highlight how we use drug utilisation review to support healthcare improvement uh, and show you some examples of how we used it during COVID. As background, uh, we don't have a national linked health data set, um, but we do have prescription dispensing data available nationally. We've had a national data set since uh, 1990. Uh, we've had the Drug Utilisation Subcommittee since 1998. Um, 
It's a patient-length data set since 2003, and it's relatively complete for all medicines uh, dispensed to patients since 2012. Covers about 90% of our prescription medicine use. We have real-time claims processing that we established in 2004, but we don't have much in the way of real-time drug utilisation review. We established our national data exchange in 2018, and that does enable real-time monitoring of controlled substances, predominantly opioids and some benzodiazepines. But all Australian states and territories have been participating since this year. We also have established e-prescribing and e-dispensing. Uh, the uptake is about 10% of all prescriptions uh, this year. In terms of how we use drug utilisation review, um, increasingly the data are used by industry to support submissions for listing products and to support their budget impact assessments, looking at the market growth, looking at the potential comparator, the cost offsets if the medicine were to be used, uh, the duration of use, persistence with use. Uh, government use it in particular to assess the budget impact post-listing to assess if use is in accord with our funded listing agreement, funded listing, sorry, to implement risk sharing arrangements, to evaluate policy and regulatory changes and for drug utilisation studies. So I wanted to show you some examples and I was going to start with budget impact assessment. So all medicines subsidised under our pharmaceutical benefit scheme are required to have a budget impact assessment prior to listing. Uh, we started this in 2001, it became formalised in 2004. Uh, and then 24 months after listing, we do a drug utilisation review to see if both expenditure and use are as predicted. So I want to show you the example with Deferacerox. Uh, Deferacerox was listed on the PBS for the treatment of chronic iron overload associated with disorders of erythropoiesis. Uh, in the budget impact, um, it was assumed that four years after listing, 80 to 90% of patients currently treated with desferioxamine would switch to deferacerox. This graph on the right shows you what happened. A blue line shows you that deferacerox did become the market leader. And while use of desferioxamine reduced a little, switching was much uh, less common than expected and most of the use was additional use. And so we had a situation where expenditure was doubled that, um, that was predicted. Delving into the data further, looking at who was using this by age and gender, we were able to see that most use was in men who were over 55. And delving into the use by strength, we were able to see most use was at the highest dose. And so much of the use was considered to be likely for myodysplastic syndrome showing us that we have use outside indication because this was not a condition that we'd established cost effectiveness in. To overcome issues like that, the Australian government established a post-market review branch within our Health Technology Assessment Unit to look at reviewing cost effectiveness of existing listings that was established in 2012. So one of the first examples I wanted to show you is we reviewed medicines for Alzheimer's disease. So the anticholinesterases were listed on our pharmaceutical scheme for mild to moderately severe dementia. At the time of listing, the trials had shown that 24 to 36% of treated patients were responders to these medicines, compared with 15 to 21% of patients with placebo. So it worked in some, it didn't work in all. And so a continuation rule was put in place to ensure cost effective use. Um, and so to continue therapy beyond six months, the treating doctor had to confirm a two point improvement in the mini mental state examination. When it came to the drug utilization review, we found unlike the trial results that 57% of patients received six months or more of treatment with doctors confirming a two-point improvement and the median duration of use was 17 months. So this analysis set off a post-market review. The post-market review looked again at the utilisation, re-examined the evidence and went out to all the stakeholders to um, gather opinions about use and what was expected. 
The review confirmed that medicine use was greater than expected and that the evidence which underpinned the original listing had not been changed. And so the PDAC recommended a 40% reduction in the price based on that uh, review to make it come into cost effectiveness lines. And so what we saw is uh, a great reduction in prices across those next few years. We can compare that with Korea because we have a different policy in the two countries and this is what we saw. I've got Korea on the left and Australia on the right. You can see uh, this is 2008 to 2019 and the Korean expenditure has kept increasing on the, uh, medicines for Alzheimer's disease while in Australia we see the dramatic drop in prices as a result of the post-market review. Uh, in terms of use, so this graph is utilisation in defined daily doses per thousand per day. Uh, Korea is um, use is increasing in line with those increasing costs. Whereas in Australia, you can see that we have stable use, relatively stable use, some switching within the market, but relatively stable use. Which shows us the potential uh, for cross-country comparisons and how cross-country comparisons can help us with policy evaluation. And I think this has been some exciting work that I've been able to do with Korea, comparing things in uh, Australia and Korea. And so I just want to show you another one. And this is uh, evaluation of pricing policy. Uh, and this is looking at generic medicine pricing policy. Australia and Korea have relatively similar approaches to generic pricing policy. We both reference price. We both have mandatory price reductions when the first generic enters the market. Um, Korea has more of a stepped pricing reduction uh, program than we do and uh, a greater initial pricing reduction, whereas Australia has a first mandatory pro price reduction and then a price disclosure um, requirement where prices are then set based on selling price into pharmacy. So we looked at this with regards to atorvastatin and what happened when atorvastatin came off patent. And here you see we have the results for both Australia and Korea. The crosses mark the time when uh, atorvastatin came off patent. So it came off patent in 2008 in Korea and 2012 in Australia. And what you can see in both countries is that we got quite a rapid um, decline in price following the generic coming onto the market. And so in both countries, this would be considered success. We see the potential for extra information when we compare the countries because while we were both successful in reducing the price, the Korean price in 2006 was three times the Australian price and it was still more than three times the Australian price after the patent expiry, suggesting there might be other things we can do for, to support pricing policy. I want to change direction now and start to look at improving medicine use and how drug utilisation review supports improving medicine use. And I want to look at this program, Veterans Mates, which, as I said, it's a data-driven health promotion program, providing up-to-date health and medicines information for the veteran community and their healthcare team. It's been funded by the Australian Government Department of Veterans Affairs since 2004. We take the data, we identify healthcare issues and trends, but we also identify actual individuals in that data who might benefit if we were to recommend some changes in care to their doctors, uh, with their doctors making those final decisions. Um, and it's a multimodal intervention. We provide education to doctors, uh, we provide education to veterans, and we provide very specific patient information to doctors uh, to to doctors about their patients, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Uh, in 2009, we moved this from a paper-based intervention to a secure e-delivery intervention. So we are in the, pro in, the, we're in the spot where we can deliver the patient information directly to the doctor's clinical desktop, and the doctor can incorporate that into the clinical record. And we've tested this compared to the paper version, and I want to show you that. Um, the example where we tested it was with pain and reducing uh, gabapentinoid use. This graphic on the left-hand side shows you what happened when pregabalin was uh, listed on the PBS. 
we've got rapid uptake in the country. The picture on the right-hand side shows you our electronic delivery to doctors where we've identified for them the patient, we've identified the pregabalin uh, in a time series over time by dose, and then we've identified if they're on opioids, the opioid doses that they're also taking in oral morphine equivalents. Uh, we've given them some extra information that might assist people in managing pain, such as whether or not they'd visit a psychologist or whether they've had a medicines review. We've listed the medicines that actually make up the um, doses there and we've given them suggested actions. And that information also has links so that they can click on it in the encounter if they want to, to go to our educational material. So the kind of educational material on the left-hand side, you see some of the information that went out to veterans themselves, three strategies to help decrease pain, moving, seeking support, changing how we think and talk about pain and examples of that. And then on the right-hand side, uh, looking more at the pain neuroscience for doctors, exploring understandings, self-management strategies, tailored type of psychological strategies, and then reviewing gabapentinoids. So what happened? Let me show you. Um, we had a 13% fall in gabapentinoid use as a result of this intervention. This intervention did go out just at the time that COVID was happening, so uh, that might have affected a little bit. Uh, but we did randomise patients in this one, or randomise doctors, sorry, to receive e-delivery information or um, postal information. And we were very pleased to see that the effect size was the same for post and digital so it didn't change. And in fact, um, for psychologist claims, which was one of the outcomes we wanted to reduce the medicine use and increase the use of psychological referrals, uh, psychologist claims uh, were better in the e-delivery group. And that's potentially because as the um, material comes into the doctor's clinical desktop, there's a uh, space in the software where they have to action it and they can then set up a referral from the software. So it's possibly got the added advantage of making referral easy. One of the opportunities when we've got this kind of um, infrastructure in place is that we can build on it. And we've certainly done that with pain. And this is just to show you, we've actually delivered four pain interventions over time. We started with this one here that we call the M3 approach, uh, which was mind, movement and medicines to introduce the biopsychosocial approach to pain. We followed it up with helping to solve the pain puzzle where we introduced the neuroscience, um, pain neuroscience to GPs. We followed that up with understanding your pain where we introduced pain neuroscience to the veterans themselves and provided them with cognitive tools that they could use. We provided doctors with tapering guides and catastrophizing scales. And then we recovered, we followed it up one more time again with recovering from pain. And so just to show you, these four arrows indicate where those interventions happened and how opioid use has shifted in Australia. The tail of this is also affected by regulation change uh, to respond to overuse of opioids in the community as a whole. But here's our opportunity to graded learning over time for people with this kind of technology. Uh, the other thing that this technology enabled us to do is respond in COVID. Um, and I was very pleased to see that HERA had been able to do something quite not similar, but in the same vein. So across last year, we absolutely focused on keeping people well during COVID. Uh, in March 2020, Australia went into lockdown and we established national telehealth services. We didn't have widespread use of telehealth before COVID. Um, information, as you all know, about the pandemic and that health kind of information uh, was changing daily. And so e-delivery became a critical um, mechanism for us to get up-to-date information to doctors. So the very first thing is we identified how many clients we had who were at risk of poor outcomes if they were to contract COVID. And more than 100,000 people in our veteran population were at high risk. Not only did we identify which risk factors they had, we also looked at the number of risk factors that people had, and a large number had three or more risk factors. We provided that information to doctors. So we wrote out, to, by e-delivery, we sent information to the doctors saying, here are your patients who meet the risk for poor outcomes, make sure they stay connected, make sure they know what to do. 
And we also provided that information out to the veterans themselves, telling them how to access telehealth, how to get the medicines delivered to their homes so that they didn't need to go out um, and to get a flu shot. We had long lockdowns in Australia and that also meant that we had a cohort who were vulnerable to mental health exacerbations. And so we followed up in July with um, identifying for the doctors the veterans who had a history of mental ill health. And again, we provided to doctors information about their patients who may be at risk and we provided them with tools and we provided these tools to the veterans themselves that they might be able to use. And they were short tools that we thought people could use in the general practice encounter. A 90 second video to understand the stress response, a two minute video to look at controlled breathing for calming emotions and a 90 second video to look at guided grounding again for calming distressing emotions. We went out a third time, so this is just our timeline in more detail, because by September, uh, in many states and territories in Australia, lockdowns were ending and we had a uh, focus on re-engaging the population, getting people active again, getting people re-engaged with their communities. We can often evaluate our work with epidemiological analyses, but I wanted to show you this one where um, we have a response, a letter written in to say thank you for our recent Veterans Makes document made me feel that someone actually cared about my health and supplied tips to assist myself and wife in control and handling the COVID virus. We found the information most useful. It made me or us feel that to DVA, we were not just ABC, not just another number. The personal touch, even from such a large department, makes us feel just that little more special and respected as seniors in the community. And they go on to note that they're quite concerned about the COVID virus to their age and their conditions. I think this is a really nice example where the digital can meet the personal and the opportunity for us to connect in ways to people. Our rapid response to COVID, uh, a bit similar to the HERA example, was possible because we had that in existing data infrastructure built. We had existing clinical teams in place who could review that evidence rapidly. We had strong stakeholder support. We have a veteran reference group and a practitioner reference group. And we went out to them with the materials before we delivered them saying, what do you think? Uh, and they gave us some very good advice. And of course, that ability to deliver directly to the clinical desktop was crucial for it being at, out the same day. So I want to finish there. Um, but over the course of my career, I've just watched data become ever more central to decision making. Drug utilisation becoming more important over time and with a greater role in pharmaceutical decision making. I think the opportunities that are emerging with real time data availability are amazing and exciting, providing us uh, with opportunities for knowledge discovery, preemptive harm prevention, proactive healthcare decision making, and really able to respond where need is in the pandemic. HERA has been at the forefront of this globally, and so I congratulate you once again and look forward to following your continued achievements, which support us all as we strive to improve medicine use and reduce harms from medicines both locally and globally. Thank you very much. Well, thank you once again, uh, Professor Rughead, for that informative uh, presentation. I think that it was also uh, great to be able to see the Australian case and the Korean case side by side in comparison, and also talking about the DUR uh, opportunities that lie ahead and how it has improved the overall system as well. Thank you once again for the great presentation. And now we will move on to our next but last speaker. Uh, this time from Australia, we go to Denmark. And Mr. Lars Seidlin Knutsen from the Danish Health Data Authority will be introducing a new topic. And so uh, Mr. Knutsen was educated in the IT University of Copenhagen and also worked in private and public organizations with IT management and leadership for over 20 years. So Mr. Knutsen will be speaking about shared 
shared medication records, improved digital patient safety in Denmark. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome him on screen. Hello, my name is Lars Seidling Knudsen. I'm the head of section of uh, medication in the Danish Health Data Authority. And it's a pleasure for me to jo be joining you today on this video presentation. Uh, I congratulate you uh, very much on your success on your own system, which safely and securely uh, administered medicine and data about medicine. Uh, we are uh, honored to be able to join you here from Denmark uh, and be a part of your celebration and congratulations again. Uh, I have been asked to join you and to talk about uh, the Danish system which uh, prescribes medicine and, and helps patient safety in Denmark and I'm happy to do that and uh, I'll do that by sharing a presentation with you. Uh, the presentation is about the Danish system, which uh, has uh, information about uh, medication. And I believe that you can uh, see the presentation now. The Danish system, which handles uh, medication, is called the shared medication record. Uh, and today I'll be speaking to you a little bit about the system. Uh, and uh, I'll talk about the purpose and the vision of the system, the implementation, some a little bit about the history and the results for Denmark. Uh, Denmark is a small country of five million people, and we pressure and value that our medication is uh, done correctly and and safely. Uh, so some of the purpose for the shared medication record uh, when it it all started. Uh, a decade ago was to create uh, one centralized system with information about the current medication for all citizens in Denmark uh, in order to ensure uh, high quality and patient safety and uh, improve treatment for Danish citizens. We wanted this system to be a secure system where uh, everybody could see their own medication and where doctors could work with medication uh, cross sectors and borderlines. So what we created and how this is used is that the doctor uh, can view the current medicine and the doctor can make prescriptions. And it's both the doctor in the hospital and in the general protections, practitioners. Then uh, the pharmacy uh, can see the medication which is uh, in real time connected. So when the doctor makes a, a pre pre prescription, all of the rest who uses the medication record uh, can see the medication. And by legislation, by law, it is required that the doctor use the shared medication record when they prescribe medicine. So almost all medication it goes through the shared medication record. The pharmacy can hand over the medicine, see what the doctor has prescribed. The home care can administer medicine from the list that the doctor had provided. And a citizen can view their current medicine and they can also order a prescription renewal. So if they knew if they have made a prescription before, if the doctor has made a prescription before, they can renew it uh, online and ask the doctor to renew the prescription. Some uh, thoughts about the implementation for the shared medication record today. Uh, the program of the shared medication record started in 2009. Uh, it started with a smaller implementation in a part of Denmark a uh, pilot program in 2010 uh, and the implementation uh, continued when the 
pilot was successful uh, to impl implement for the hospitals and the general practitioners and, and part of the pharmacies. This was done so that every citizen in Denmark would have what we call a medication card where you can see what this, the, the citizen gets in prescription medication and this card needs to be updated for all Danish citizens. So uh, it took some time before uh, the medication record for every Dan Danish per person was updated. And in 2016 uh, and 2015, the implementation continued in the uh, muni municipalities and for the citizens with the app, which came in 2016. The implementation has continued and is still continuing. Uh, in 2016 to 19, the dentists, the abuse centers, the incitation and the prison probation service uh, was also connected to this centralized uh, service, which uh, shows prescription medicine to all the, the health uh, system in Denmark. There is an app, as I, as I told you, the app, you can see your current medication. All citizens can say, see their prescription medication. They can see uh, also how to renew the pres prescription, ask the doctor to renew it. Some of the results of implementing the system has been that the paper prescription, which is this line, has gone down and the digital prescription almost fill every uh, prescription in Denmark. So uh, there's uh, about uh, one million transfers to this system every day, uh, which can be uh, seen by all uh, the systems which are connected to the medication system. So uh, it has been uh, a journey and a lot of changes for, for the society to, uh, and some of the positive changes of the shared medication record for healthcare professionals has been that uh, because the system is directly embedded in the local systems, then the workflow that they have in their own system uh, can, has, has been obtained they can still use their own system where this part is just a service which they use within their local system. Uh, the shared medication record is online and it's real-time updated. So that means that uh, different sectors of the healthcare system has real-time information about the medication for the patient. So in former times before this system, uh, the different sectors has their own system which held uh, information about uh, the, the citizen. Then uh, some kind of exchange by messages was uh, taken from one system to another system. This was a very handheld process and it was not secure. This uh, system has been implemented to, to uh, make the patient safety a lot better. And when it was more handheld system, then it was not sure that every sector would be able to update their own system in real time. That could mean that if a patient was uh, committed to a hospital, that uh, the medication was not correctly. So uh, some people could have been mistreated uh, because their medication uh, record was not accurate in their own sector. This problem has now been eliminated. Uh, all sectors use the same uh, central service to get the medication uh, overview. And this uh, medication overview is always updated and always real time. Another uh, benefit for the healthcare professionals is that a citizen themselves can also see the medi medication information. And that actually helps the healthcare professional because the citizen can tell the healthcare professionals that their medication record uh, needs to be added some things if that is the case. Some of the challenges for this system has been in the initial update of the medication overview. As I told you before, uh, 
uh, all the medication uh, records for every citizen need to be updated. And this has, of course, been a process. So in the beginning, some of the medication was updated and some was not, which could lead to confuses and, and confusement. Uh, this has, uh, however, been overcome now that all the medication records have been updated. Um, it has also been a journey that the healthcare professionals uh, could learn how to use the, the shared medication record uh, in the right way so that they could update in the right way across sectors. Uh, this has been a learning process which is, uh, is landing quite, quite well now. Uh, and also the knowledge about all medication. What is all medication? We have in Denmark decided that the medication which has to be uh, implemented and, and, uh, and accurate on the shared medication record is only the pre prescription medication. Uh, and in that way, uh, the healthcare professionals had to learn what prescription medication uh, was in, in the shared medication record sense and what should be uh, not admi admitted to the shared medication record. Some uh, statistics uh, about the shared medication record. We have made uh, different quality re reviews of the medication record uh, to know if, uh, if it provided an accurate view of the present medication for the patient. Uh, we made uh, some in 2016 and some, to, some in 2019. It has shown that every uh, medication is accurate. However, some is more accurate than other. Uh, the ones who are not accurate is, is smaller, uh, smaller differences between what they're actually taking and not taking. So it is not uh, important for the patient's safety. Uh, most of the of what is not uh, accurate. Uh, some of the changes for the citizens is that they have access to a shared medication record. They can actually see what is in the systems of the doctor and the hospital of what medication they they're taking. They can also see what they are, uh, should be taking of medication, and they can connect uh, to the doctors if they if they don't agree on the medication if they or if they're confused about something. So this overview of prescription medicine uh, and the self-service they, they can use has been a great improvement for the citizens. Uh, and the increased uh, patient safety has of course been a result which has been uh, connected to the citizens and, and uh, the, the citizens' patient safety has become better because of the shared medication record. Some of the challenges which always comes with a system like this is how the patient trusts the accuracy in the system. Uh, it takes some getting used to that there's a system which can provide details about you as a citizen, so it takes some trust. Then there has also been a question of the privacy. Can the citizen uh, really trust that the privacy is being upheld? and that nobody who should not have access to the data, data doesn't have access to the data. Uh, this has been overcome by information and, and uh, telling the citizens exactly who has access, who has not access, and in that way uh, providing information to the citizen about what uh, the medic shared medication record is all about and how it's being uh, handled and, and how the system is being controlled. Um, so uh, some changes for the society uh, for the shared medication record. There's been a, a great uh, improvement that there's one medication record that is not a, a medication a system which is sector specific. The patient has been empowered as I told you. Uh, there's also actually been a reduced use of medication. Uh, that means that if one sector could see what the other sector has been prescribing to the patient, then actually they might not have to prescribe themselves the medication. So we can actually see in statistics that uh, there has been a reduced use of medication uh, in this period of time. Uh, the quality and the patient safety 
and the treatment has become better because the healthcare professional can see what the other sectors has actually uh, provided in prescription medicine for the patient. Uh, the full digitalization of the medication process has been able enable us to see what is actually uh, happening in the medication process in the different sectors. So that could have been able to have been optimized. Uh, and uh, another positive change is that the medication record has been uh, a, an icebreaker for new shared initiatives. It's, it's been possible, it's been, it's been uh, obvious that it's possible to make a system uh, where uh, data has been able to be shared across sectors in the healthcare system from the municipality to the general protectionists to the pharmacies to the uh, citizens themselves. Uh, it's of course been uh, some challenges uh, for this program of shared medication record uh, during the implementation. Some of it has been that it's a large program across multiple sectors with a lot of stakeholders which might have different opinions so they had to be able to change their mindset and to be able to see this as a as a shared benefit to have a system like this uh, it's been small changes in workflows for the different sectors and then the technology roadmap and coordination have of course been proved to be time consuming but uh, all in all, we've been keeping our plans and we've been keeping to the, to the final goal of the system. Lastly, it's just to say uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, congratulations again with your system. And it's been such a pleasure and honor to be a part of, uh, of this day where, uh, it's, uh, where we celebrate your medication system. Thank you very much that I could be a part of this and that Denmark could, could contribute to this big day for you. Thank you once again, Mr. Knudsen, for the great presentation on Denmark and the case studies as well as uh, the improvement cases as well. And now, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes all of our presentations for today. And before we move on to the panel discussion, we'll take a very short break to set the stage and resume with our panelists. So please do not go anywhere. Uh, we will just take a brief break to set the stage. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience. Uh, we are now trying to reconnect with uh, one of our speakers who will be a uh, panelist from overseas. So we just need about three more minutes. So we kindly ask for your patience once again, and we will resume with the panel discussion in three minutes. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, for your patience, and we will now resume with our panel discussion. The panel discussion will invite the three presenters from today, as well as two others, to join us in the overall discussion. So uh, we also have Dr. Nick uh, Klazinga from the OECD, Professor Libby Rughead from the University of South Australia, and Dr. Luke Swavomirsky uh, from the OECD as the panelist. And of course, uh, we have a couple of our presenters here on site right next to me. And one of the panel discussants will be Dr. Tongsuk Kim, a research fellow and a division director at the Quality Assessment Department from HERA. And she is a research fellow for the Review and Assessment Research Department and has been researching drug utilization review and polypharmacy. And Dr. Luke Slavomirsky is a health economist and former clinician. He's worked on policy roles for the Australian government, state and federal level. And since 2015, he has been with the OECD as well. And I believe that during uh, this time, he has been looking into e-health, digital transformation and health data governance and is currently a part of the team reviewing the health data and information system for the Republic of Korea. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I will introduce our moderator for today. Professor Pyeongju Park of Seoul National University will do us the honors of being the moderator. Moderator, the floor is yours. Professor Park, please use the microphone. Much. 네. 
Thank you for the warm introduction. And I would like to congratulate Hira on the 10th anniversary of the adoption of DUR. So this is very personal for me. As have been mentioned in my presentation slides, in 2004, I was part of the DUR committee that has been formed by the Ministry of Health and Welfare. So I would like to also mention that the DUR committee meeting has been organized by HERA, and we were also supported uh, financially by HERA. So Ms. Kimboyeon or Mr. Kimboyeon used to be the team leader back in 2004. I would like to thank him or her for uh, the efforts. I was impressed by the efforts and the sacrifice and the commitment shown. And I think this serves as a backbone for us to grow as a healthcare system. It has been a while since I met him or her, but I was very impressed. So as have been mentioned in my presentation, when DUR was first introduced, it was met with opposition by the medical industry. So we had concerns, but over time, the DUR system was able to evolve and improve and grow into what it is today. So I would like to have, uh, I would like to make a comment to the president of HERA. So now we have the DUR system that is well functioning and big data analysis of HERA was not met with a uh, welcome in the beginning stages. So I know that many hardships and challenges were overcame. So I hope that this turns, serves as an opportunity so that we would be able to further develop the system over the next decade so that we can contribute to the national health care. So in the panel discussion, as have been mentioned by today's MC, we have six panelists or sorry, five panelists with us today. Three panelists made the presentations and two panelists did not have an opportunity to make a presentation. So I think we would like to hear some thoughts from the two panelists that have not presented before. So I think we can start with Mr. or Dr. Luke Slaromirsky to make some comments before we get into the panel discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Park. Um, thank you for the invitation to be with you today. And um, the first thing I would like to say is uh, congratulations. Uh, congratulations to Hira, congratulations to Korea on, on 10 years of what, what is one of the, the leading um, platforms, leading programs in ensuring uh, safe medication dispensing and use um, in the world. So my sincere congratulations and thanks for the invitation. Um, I had I had the opportunity to to listen to the recordings of of some of the um, presentations today, and the ones I didn't, I, I certainly looked at the slides, and they are they all tell a fascinating story. And the one thing I would probably emphasize is that. In each case, each case in what we've heard, we've heard from Professor Roughhead, heard from, heard from um, Dr. Oderkirk from an international perspective, uh, Mr. Knudsen in Denmark, and of course your, your local experiences in, in, um, in Korea, is that building these kind of systems, these kinds of systems and programs that really advance um, patient outcomes and social outcomes and policy outcomes um, takes a lot of time and takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of persuasion. So what I mean by that is Dr. Park mentioned in his, in his presentation and also in, in the introduction to this session that there was a lot of resistance there was a lot of resistance initially to, to implement the the, DUR, the DUR um, because people are generally um, afraid of change and especially when it comes to information and data in, in health, 
people are especially afraid because obviously the information is sensitive from a privacy perspective, but also information is power. And if you relinquish um, knowledge and information, you also they run the risk of relinquishing power. So the challenge for policymakers is to <clears throat> bring people along to, we say in, in Australia or in English countries, to win, to win hearts and minds, to persuade people on an intellectual level and also on an emotional level that this is the right thing to do and that the change will not only benefit patients, but it will also benefit them. It will make their practice um, a lot better and the outcomes of their practice a lot better and more efficient. So that for me is, is the common thread in, um, in today's presentations that we've heard. Uh, so it requires a lot of patience. And the three things I would like to emphasize, um, which are from Dr. Oderkirk's presentation earlier, is that what we've seen across the world, the, the systems that are successful in, in transitioning towards a more digital data-driven health uh, environment and ecosystem is um, uh, three things really, and that's uh, in, in terms of the digital strategy is that the health information system has to be uh, mature and, and the, the key health data has to be um, of high quality and, and can be, it's coded in a way that can be integrated and that the different data silos can talk to each other. They are interoperable. Um, they don't necessarily, all the data don't necessarily have to sit in the same place, but they have to be used the same language, um, the same standards. Um, the fundamental importance of electronic health record system is, cannot be overstated because that's where a lot of the interesting out, uh, information, especially on outcomes, patient outcomes, resides. Um, and of course, governance uh, is also critical. So you need proper legislation, fit for purpose laws and policies that allow health data to be um, linked and, and used for, for these purposes, such as the, the DUR. And part of that um, governance is, of course, winning the public trust and winning the trust of stakeholders, which is um, what I began my, my intervention with. And I would like to finish my intervention with emphasizing that this is always a socio-technical socio transformation. It's never just about um, data science and numbers and ones and zeros. It's about bringing people with you. And that's um, a key to success. Thank you. Thank you. I was planning to ask you related question and thank you for your remark. I meant to ask you a related question. Our last presenter in Denmark, the shared medical record, all Denmark citizens data is integrated under one system and it sounded ideal. Uh, as the presenter explained that the population of 5 million, that's possible, but when the population size is much larger like Korea or the US, maybe it is not as feasible. So maybe more important thing could be privacy protection, whether it can be protected safely. That's one thing I'm concerned about. Because you mentioned it, I'd like to ask a question now. Um, for OECD member countries, I think you have compared different nations in your explanation. I'm curious about the data availability in each country, but the data quality evolution uh, have not been mentioned today too much. So maybe uh, in the perspective of OECD, the health data in different con countries, do you have any evaluation of data quality amongst the OECD nations? Do we have any results about that or experience? Oh, sorry, I think you are you are on mute. We cannot hear your voice. Mm 
Please open your audio. Mic is muted. Is that better? Yes, yes. I can hear you. Okay. Okay, sorry. I, I, I was unmuted. I just clicked a few times and it seems to have um, fixed. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Park, for that question. It's, it's a good follow-up question um, to, to my initial remarks. Um, let me just say, it's a, ve it's a very good point you raise about um, comparing countries like Denmark with a small population and a small geography to countries like Korea with a much larger population with a more distributed geography and then beyond that to countries like the United States with a massive population um, and obviously a very big country geographically and also a very complex um, health system in terms of uh, funding and, and information flows but um, it's not necessary for the, it's not, it's not cru crucial for all the data to be in one place, so on one record, which Denmark has been able to achieve for its population. But many countries are uh, using what's called a, a federated model or a distributed model, which, which has also been used in Korea for some research around um, COVID-19 um, impacts and, and outcomes, where the, the data about each patient's medications, for example, it's what we're talking about today, remain in their, in their place with the provider or wherever the data are held. And, uh, but the query um, come, goes to the data. So the query is sent from whoever wants to know the answer to the data when the data are distributed in all the different nodes. So, but this only works if the data are coded in a uniform way. So if a common data model is adopted, um, and that is obviously a lot more palatable from a, to people from a privacy point of view, um, because they know that their information never leaves the place where it is kept, it's never aggregated anywhere. But yet um, uh, the questions about what, medic what medication they're on or the dosage and, and other factors uh, can, be, can be reached and can be answered and sent back to the person answering the question. Um, this is the way the, the United States um, runs their pharmacovigilance um, or post-market surveillance program at the Sentinel Initiative, which, which um, you heard about earlier from Gillian Odekirk. Um, and Gillian also talked a little bit about um, data quality and maturity and um, data governance, which is the second part of your question. And we do actually have some information um, based on surveys of countries, uh, wh which countries are, have um, health data that are more ready to be used for these secondary purposes like pharmacovigilance or prescribing. And um, <clears throat> in terms of um, quality, maturity and, and use and also governance. And uh, Korea is actually in the, in the top, uh, top three, top four countries um, out of the, uh, I think, 21 or 22 countries that responded to our survey. So Korea is up there with, with Denmark, uh, with Finland, uh, with Canada, Sweden, um, and with France, uh, where the, with, with um, good, good policies and good, um, good communication and PR and, and getting that social license, um, the, the health data, even though it's not kept in the same place necessarily, can start to be used for, for ve very useful purposes um, and because it's of sufficient quality and, um, and it's coded in a way that enables queries to reach it. So, so some countries are doing a much better than others in the OECD. We do have data on that, and, but thankfully Korea is, is in the top quadrant. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your answer. Then now I would like to move on to Ms. Tong Soo Kim for her comments. Thank you for your introduction. I am Kim Dong Suk. As a part of HERA members, I'd like to also congratulate on the achievement of 10 years of DUR. It's an honor to have 
heard about the presentations and to have an opportunity to have a voice here. Um, I would like to once more emphasize about DUR and its achievement, but before doing that, I would like to comment something about Nick Cla Dr. Nick, Nick Klazinga's presentation. You mentioned something about the antibiotics use in diabetes in Korea. I would like to explain something. From 2001, HERA began antibiotics use evaluation uh, for common cold, and we began the same assessment for acute lower respiratory infection in 2019. Also, we conducted pay for performance from 2014, but the outpatient use is quite high in Korea and the medical society is quite competitive. And because the access of care is quite easy in Korea, the environment is quite different and the demand of patients for antibiotics is quite high. According to a research in 2010, Australian NPS, um, there was a scenario to do training for antibiotics use. And there was a survey amongst Korean physicians. And amongst 1,000, they received 344 response. Um, in Australia, antibiotics use was 7%. And in Korea, 70% uh, of doctors answer that they will use antibiotics. There were many researches that it's really hard to change doctor's behavior in prescription, but we can, uh, it's even harder to prevent them prescribing certain drugs. This is a kind of culture and a prescription behavior is really important. So about antibiotics, I hope that you understand the complexity of environment. We are putting much effort to reduce antibiotics. And moving on to DUR development, ways for the future. As mentioned before by some other presenters from 2008, we began within prescription review began for pregnancy precaution and drug-drug interaction. And from 2010, December, uh, thanks to Hira's efforts and dedication, it was really hard to persuade the medical society, but we did begin the between prescription review for drug-drug interaction, duplicated ingredients, and also efficacy, duplication, these types of review began. And in other countries, usually capitation is common and you have family doctor, so the environment is quite different in Korea. But the between prescription review became really important issue when we talk about patient safety. So for Korean DUR, there are three major achievements thanks to the IT development. First is that we shared information to guarantee the patient safety. The satisfaction rate was also high. We saved drug expenditure thanks to reduced uh, duplication and also there was much less hazardous use and mobility and mortality thanks to the prevention efforts. So there was lots of social benefits and also thanks to the real-time network of DUR, you, we could use it for other additional services. DUR has drug safety functions and it's quite sufficient, but there are other things we could cover and if I address them, that would be uh, drug allergy and drug doses, dosage adjustment for renal patients and those uncovered area like obesity drugs and other uncovered drugs and how we can strike the balance of fatigue because the warning could cause uh, fatigue to the physicians. Lastly, about the general pharmaceutical consumption, I would like to point out two things for the future. WHO began Global Patient Safety Challenge Initiative. It was called Medication Without Harm. It began in 2017. So the damage usually 
come from medication era, and the cost for that is $42 billion every year. So we want to reduce medication-related harm by 50% within five years. Drug-related problem, DRP, is a stumbling block for us to go to optimize result. But um, usually 5 to 15% of problems come from this drug-related DRP. So Korea also needs to set up an index for this issue. Secondly, in the WHO report, there were three areas to resolve. One of them was polypharmacy. I think Nick Klazinga, Dr. Nick Klazinga and Professor Park mentioned uh, this issue of polypharmacy, and it is becoming even more complicated issue in Korea. The low birth rate and aging population is a serious problem in Korea, and the report medication without harm after that in Australia in 2019, there was another report to reduce polypharmacy. And according to that 2019 report from Australia, the efforts to reduce polypharmacy need to be prepared in Korea, and we need to work with other countries as well for this effort to reduce uh, Hira will continue to do its role for safe use of drug. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. So now we will start to ask questions to each other and answer them. So I would like to ask you to feel to speak freely or let me start by asking a question to Mr. Nicholas Klazinga. So thank you very much for your perspective presentation. And you have taken some cases including antibiotics, diabetes, and opioids usage. So I looked at the graphs and I thought, so in the case of opioid use in the US, FDA, has declared a war against opioids. So I think the U.S. is reacting to the use of opioids in a very aggressive and active manner. But despite these efforts, if we look at the graph that you presented from 2016 and so on, the opioid use in the U.S. dramatically increased. I would like to ask if you know why. Thank you, <coughs> Professor Park, for your for your question. And let me also again tell you it, it's it's a pleasure to be on this panel today, and also have a direct in-person contribution to the 10-year anniversary of your drug utilization review program. You're correct. In my presentation, I try to show from a whole system perspective how prescribing data can signal policies. And, and problems in healthcare systems. And I used the, 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 the data for antibiotics use, opioid use, and use of uh, hypertensive medication in people who have diabetes. Your question on op opioids was, was actually a, a big issue about four years ago. I, in my presentation, I, I mentioned a report <coughs> that the OECD issued in 2019 which was actually written on the request of the Canadian government to get an overview of the problem. And although I don't know all the details in the US, but what I know from, from the literature is, is of course the, <clears throat> the whole liberal way of prescribing people getting addicted to opioids in their professional system. So yes, there the rates are very high, but the, the, the crisis in the, in the US luxated interest in, in other countries. And this type of data that, that the, the OECD collects can actually help to, to, to address that. And to make the link to <coughs> drug utilization review and, and professionals, it is this kind of balance 
of on the one hand knowing your prescribing data and seeing that a certain medication is prescribed in a very high level compared with other countries, that makes you also think about the underlying mechanisms in which the professional groups control the quality of their prescribing. Dr. Kim was referring to, to that also, <clears throat> but as you heard in my presentation, I really emphasis, emphasized the needs of the learning infrastructure, the quality assurance infrastructure that is in place also for the profession to work on guidelines and to evaluate systematically the, the, their, their prescribing practices. Because that's at the root, that and together with the, the health literacy of, of patients, those are the roots where you introduce rational prescribing. That is the interaction between the doctor and the patient. So also <clears throat> on both ends, information can help to rationalize that decision. And that's the plea I try to make in my presentation that if you want to optimize the use of this perfect data information system on, 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 on drug utilization, please make sure that this information is also used by professionals and by patients to raise their awareness of our prescribing. And then, um, happy to see that opioid rates are much lower in other countries. It's more under control, but the general mechanism should be in place for all drugs, that there is a continuous monitoring on the system level, but it's linked to the micro level of prescribing, where the, the patient knows what is prescribed and, and, and what the, the risks are, and the doctor gets feedback. I took note of Dr. Kim's remark that there is some fatigue of the, the warnings that the system gives to your practices. I can fully understand that, but please bear in mind that it's better to get some fatigue there than not having warnings at all. So I think the challenge is to find mechanisms of a local drug utilization review, and I mentioned in my presentation examples of structures I know exist in Denmark and in the Netherlands, where groups of professionals stimulated by the insurer, but are actually evaluating on a systematic way their prescribing practices and have a structural dialogue with the pharmacists about the prescribing. That's the best guarantee if you have such a learning system in place that the data are actually used for rational prescribing and you can prevent the, the kind of exaborations that we've seen uh, with opioid use in the, in the US. Thank you. By comparing different countries, we could learn about the issues related to prescription and that awareness would be really important. Also, the close communication between doctors and pharmacists would be also significant. Thank you for your comment. Now, I would like to turn to Dr. Libby. Uh, very nice to see you again. In the case of Australia, the budget impact assessment was well explained by you, and the post-market review was also introduced. Both were for cost-effective analysis. And I was curious about, based on those analysis, when you, you just reduced the price. In Australia, the pharmaceutical companies, didn't you meet with any opposition from the pharmaceutical companies? How did you appease them? How did you explain to them? And my second question is about the atrobastatins example. Uh, you showed us the graph. and. Probably Korea is Korea's graph was much sharper than that of Australia, and in 2016, in particular, in Australia it was 0 0.69, but in Korea it was about over two dollars. So the pricing policy, how different were they? Why the gap was so big? Please explain. 
Um, thank you, BJ. It's very nice to see you um, and it's very nice to be here. Um, with regards to uh, the post-market review and the budget impact assessments, the Australia Government have a memorandum of understanding with the industry that there is an agreed process. And so all the way along, um, our systems and structures are, are agreed processes. So it's an ongoing negotiation. And so those price drops aren't just, uh, but they are saying this was the agreed cost effective price. And therefore, when we find utilizations outside of that, if the, the negotiation will continue with the price. So when the post-market reviews happen, um, we have stakeholder engagement at every step of the way. So before a review starts, there's a consultation. As the review goes on, there's an opportunity for consultation. Um, all of the work that is done by government, the, the draft responses go out to industry and we get pre-committee um, responses from the industry that are built into the considerations. So I think it's, again, um, that idea Luke was talking about of the social kind of uh, connection needing to be part of that, so the strong stakeholder engagement going along the way. Um, with regards to the analysis of atorvastatin and the um, relative falls, so yes, Korea had a larger relative fall uh, than Australia, but I think this interesting question for me was why was the Korean price? Given our systems, our systems are quite similar. Uh, we both have reference pricing, we both have mandatory price reductions. So this interesting question of why the Korean price at the beginning was quite high, um, I'm not sure, uh, but I think these, probably my more important point, these kinds of comparisons help us understand successes or opportunities for further improvement in both countries. Thank you for your remark. Uh, can we respond to her um, with Dr. Kim Chol-soo or uh, Dr. Kim dong -suk? Thank you. I, I think that was the research we did with Professor Libby. In 2017, the positive listing system was adopted in Hira. Um, using the economic evaluation, we wanted to focus on cost effectiveness high efficacy drugs before this introduction of positive listing it was negative listing system and hira have hira has decided the price but before the association of pharmaceutical companies uh, used to set up the price as well but we can say that hira began the pricing uh, from the adoption of positive listing system Usually, we use the average price of the seven advanced countries, and we used it as a reference. But at the time, maybe that's why it was relatively high, highly priced in Korea. But this is the unit price for DDD. So maybe that's, we cannot say it's just price. It's, it's a little misleading. Thank you very much. Now we will start the Q&A session among the panelists. So if you have any questions to ask, please feel free to speak up. It is very unfortunate that we are experiencing some technical issues, so I think we will uh, discuss some questions or answers with the panelists that are present in this room. So let me ask a question to Mr. Kim Chol Su. So you mentioned the three tasks of HERA, and I know that they are of great importance to improve the management system of 
inappropriate medication. So due to the time limit, we weren't able to get all the details. So is there anything, any additional plans that you would like to mention in regard to the management and comprehensive data needs to be created? And also the DUI information that is more specific to the patient needs to be provided. So you did mention about the three task plans of HERA. Can you please elaborate on them? Thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. I believe that Professor Park was the chairman for the drug management KDIS, and uh, maybe I am the one to seek advice from you. Um, I think this was commonly mentioned by other foreign presenters as well. Um, Korea's medic medicine management system need to develop in terms of substantial aspect rather than the size or shape. Um, All presenters mentioned that we need to build an integrated data set to build a national integrated system. And also, we need to organically connect the private sector data with our national data to build patient unit data set. And that is another sophistication method for Korea for the future. We are um, giving thoughts about that too. But the biggest obstacle was that this might be unique to Korea, that privacy protection is quite stringent. Therefore, in the future, we need to have deregulation regards privacy protection measures. That should be our groundwork so we can further advance our current DUR system. And the patient customized patient unit drug provision is already validated. We have this drug-centered management system, but ultimately we need to have patient unit-based system, the medication information held by Hira and also from the KDIS data, also the abnormal cases collected by the government, adverse adverse cases, those need to be shared with Hira, or we should connect the data so we can have more comprehensive and integrated, uh, more proactive management. So we can produce more integrated data in terms of pharmaceuticals. Thank you very much for your comments, for mentioning the ultimate goal. So once this is concrete, I would, I think we would be able to move forward. But there would be many hurdles that will have to be overcome and challenging. So I just asked out of concern. And thank you very much for mentioning the clear direction that HERA is moving towards. And I can see your commitment toward making this happen. And from the last presentation of Denmark regarding the SMR, the shared medical records, so as a matter of fact, so technically, we would be able to make it happen. It's feasible on the technical side, but in order to do so, we need to overcome the private or privacy protection law and so on. So there's, there are some regulations that need to be responded to. And in the presentation, the safety culture was mentioned. We need to have a better attitude, raise awareness towards safety. And we need to reach a social consensus, which will take time and a lot of effort from not only HERA, but from all of us as a whole. Welcome back. It's glad to have you back. Hi. Do you have any question or comments? Uh, uh, Luke, yes, uh, do you have any Professor Park. more comments for us? Yes, um, Professor Park, um, I do. Uh, thank you. Um, I was interested to hear um, Mr. Knudsen from Denmark's, um, one of his 
slides was on the the benefits of the the unified medication record and that was to to reduce the volume of prescribing so reduce polypharmacy um, because prescribers saw what other prescribers had been um, prescribing for the patient so a more, they had a more holistic view of, of the patient's medication situation um, overall, this this resulted in in fewer medications being prescribed and then presumably used. Now, all other things being equal, this is a good thing. Um, and I was wondering if there is any um, any evidence in in Korea that this has been the case um, through the nationalisation of the DUR uh, and in any other initiatives. Whether you've seen similar sort of uh, effects. Um, I know there's been a reduction in in uh, adverse drug events and um, and and other adverse outcomes, uh, but I was actually wondering about pharmacy and and the amount of medications being dispensed. Thank you. 네, 그 질문에 대해서 우리 I believe that. Researcher Kim dong -soo could answer. If you say evidence, recently the International Journal for Health Quality in Healthcare, there was a research paper published in ISQUA through DUR, Drug Drug Interaction, and the inpatient occurrence were, was reduced after adoption of DUR, thanks to the prevention of drug-drug interaction, we had to investigate more, but DDI had wide scope because it has 600 elements. So we focused on benzodiazepine and the enzyme inhibitor and QTC medicine, those were the focus area for that paper. So we have this evidence that the inpatient were reduced thanks to DUR intervention. And there are many papers in Korea, published in Korea, um, proving that the occurrence of such inpatient cases were reduced in number, uh, referencing HERA data and other organizations' data. There are, I think, dozens of them. Thank you very much for the clarification. Dr. Klasinga. So for the further development of HERA, do you have any comments to make? Any advice? The struck by by your remark about safety culture so I, I would like just like to stress the the, the the potential of course that the drug utilization review data can have for patient safety that that's without saying <clears throat> and you should be applauded of having the, the the system in place to do that and you well dr. Kim just referred to the paper in the Esquad journal that it's a good testimony of what what can be done but what comes clear from the discussion the overall <clears throat> um, yeah the overall feeling on how to use this data basically how to turn data into information and intelligence and being picked up by professionals and by 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 citizens that is a key element and with respect to patient safety that means that in addition to measuring the adverse events in medication and, and moving to the direction of multi-prescribing <clears throat> multi in, in, in elderly, it, it's also good to look at the culture side. As you probably aware, the, the OECD has been working on a long series of reports on the economics of patient safety. Actually, my colleague uh, Luke Slavarmiski is the, the co-author of, uh, of many of them. And what comes out in the more recent reports is the necessity of combining the 
the, the measurement and, and of, of the clinical safety elements and the measurement of the, the working culture. And actually there is a project on the way of measuring patient safety culture. It's still focusing on hospitals, but we're trying to explore that broader by using standardized surveys to not only ask professionals about and confront them with adverse events or, or warnings, but also ask them about the, the culture in which they work, where they feel that they have the right information, they feel free to report things that went wrong. So I would just like to stress the, the importance of, of going in that route. And in addition to the patient safety culture measurements that my colleague Kate Bianasis at the OECD is coordinating, we have a similar pathway of asking patients about their safety experiences. So it's good to note and happy to mention to you that, that one of the next reports in the, the series that the OECD is doing on the economics of patient safety will be on medication safety. So actually we have been commissioned by the, the German government to produce a report over the coming year on medication safety and I think I will be happy to, to come to, to the experience of DER in South Korea to tell your story, but I can already announce that it will be the same. The balancing of the measurement from a clinical, pharmaceutical perspective and the measurement of the overall culture and the willingness of professionals and, uh, and citizens to not just look at the data, but use them as information that influences their own behavior. 네, 감사합니다. Thank you very much for your insight and your emphasis on the safety culture. I think that would be something that will take some time to establish a culture and also change our attitude and mindset, but that is something that we need to continue to work on. So, Professor Libby, do you have any comments to make or any advice for the further advancement, advancement of the DUI system? Uh, just to follow on from Nick's comments about this important both culture and systems. So in Australia, um, one of the surprises of COVID has been the influence on our antibiotic use. So we tried for 20 years to improve antibiotic use by looking at either patient education or prescriber education, and we failed again and again and again. It was a stubborn flat line. And COVID came along and antibiotic use has fallen consistently by 36% in our communities. It is a huge reduction. And so it points to the fact, and so here is drug utilisation in action to say it is infection control that we need to give messaging about in our community, not prescribe this or that, but infection control. And so that has got me thinking a lot about what are the other cultural or organisational factors that influence things like the overuse of opioids or the overuse of antidepressants and where can we um, as drug utilisation experts assist in getting information into other parts of the system. Uh, I'm sure that in Australia the antibiotic use was stopped because people didn't feel pressured to go to work and didn't feel pressured to give their children antibiotics to get them back into childcare because we were all saying, if you are sick, stay home. And so I think there is a lot to be considered and learnt from how do we integrate ourselves, not just within that health system, but in that broader contextual organisational system so that we um, get thriving systems as well as thriving people to enable um, appropriate medicine use. 네, Thank you. To build a safe environment, we need to have good education from early childhood, from elementary school, middle school, throughout high school and university, and also citizen education. The education for the public should be done properly and also for the training and education for healthcare professionals is also required. So in the field about DUR system, we can collect the actual response from patients and doctors. For example, in DUR system, the alert 
fatigue was a term we used because for the physician, they want to disregard and they can continue with the existing prescription. And should we let them do that? Or should we find out the reasons why they behave that way and improve their patterns and improve also the system as well? Um, those, would, those things would be the measures for future development. Uh, Ms. Kim also mentioned that it's included in the future development plan, improvement plan. So we will work from the field and analyze, learn about the field to come up with better plans. Now we are reaching to the end of this symposium. Um, the floor is open if you want to comment the last time about anything. Would you like to give us a remark? Good afternoon again. Today, in commemoration of 10th anniversary of DUR, you attended this symposium. I would like to thank again for the speakers. We research and develop DUR every day and communicate with Australia, Denmark, Netherlands. We always benchmark those advanced cases from overseas. We continue with our research and also your comments are valuable uh, to uh, uh, those were very impactful to me and I think many opinions uh, made it clear that future direction is clear and we need to continue to improve and mature our system and the advice would be really helpful and valuable. I will seek your advice individually as well if you allow us. Um, as Professor Park mentioned, DUR system has its clear position. Uh, it's for patient safety system to care them um, and it's sufficient in its role at the moment, but there were lots of hardships and difficulties that we had overcome. And there is a difficult way to go as well. I f feel I have a heavy heart when I think of those difficulties, but I'm very thankful that you gave us fruitful comments and advice, and I will do my part, my best to improve the UR system. Thank you again. Thank you very much for showing your commitment on behalf of HERA. So would you like to make any last comments? Oh, I see a hand raised by Dr. Luke. Please go ahead. Is it for us? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, well, well, thank you. I, I was I was going to follow up on um, Professor Ruffhead and Professor Klausinger's comments in terms of health literacy and um, in in my work in in our work on patient safety and the best um, po policy and strategic in it, um, <clears throat> uh, interventions to to improve patient safety, especially I think medication safety is to not underestimate the power of uh, of the patient as a as a fantastic and powerful resource to to improve their medication management and and their medication safety um, and I think having re having started reviewing the Korean um, health data and information system uh, which is very strong and has very strong foundations and DOR is as I said um, uh, an absolutely global example of of clinical decision support. Um, for me, the the one missing ingredient perhaps is including the patient in the information loop a little bit more as well. And there's a lot of evidence to to suggest to show us that um, an involved patient and engaged patient with good literacy and good information at their disposal. Um, is also a, a much safer patient. So, um, my 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 closing remarks would be around that to in, to involve patients um, 
in the in the digital transformation, and of course, um, uh, s smartphones are, are such a, a fantastic tool to enable that. Um, <clears throat> they're already there, and they they need to be harnessed. I think um, to to capitalize on this underused resource in patient safety um, as we move towards the next phase of DUR and and other similar platforms around the world. So. Um, so I want to congratulate you all and congratulate Korea on, on the system and um, and just um, suggest that the patient be be included in, in every step of the way. 네, Thank you very much for your advice. So I think it's very significant. In Korea, we have something called the My Health Data. So. The patients are able to input their data on an individual level, but due to privacy law, to expand it to population base is challenging. That's why, as has been mentioned, we are trying to go around or we are trying to consider the privacy law to make sure that we can actually benefit the patients uh, with data utilization. So based on this, uh, based on this assumption, we need to improve the issue. So we are technically capable, based on our ICT uh, technology, we are technically feasible, but there are some regulations that we need to weather out that is keeping us from having a more shared database. I hope that this would be an area that Hira could continue to work on, and thank you for your comment. So thank you all for joining us today despite your busy schedule to talk about a very critical issue, to make presentations, to enlighten us with perspectives. Thank you very much for all of your time and words of wisdom. So with this, I would like to conclude the 10-year anniversary of the adoption of DUR System International Symposium with this. Or I would like to wrap up the panel discussion, but the official closing would be done by the MC of the event. Thank you very much. Please give another big round of applause for our moderator as well as our panel discussants, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Well, thank you to all of our audiences as well for listening in and paying attention all the way until the very end. But unfortunately, it is time for us to close our symposium for today. Um, held under the title DUR, the accomplishments of the past 10 years and DURITS responses to COVID-19, I hope that today was a great opportunity for all of our participants and, of course, uh, a great forum for further discussions as well. Uh, with this, we would like to close, but of course, we will come back next year with another timely subject. So thank you once again, ladies and gentlemen, for your participation. Please do stay safe and healthy until we meet next year. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we will resume tomorrow with the international training course at 4.30 p.m. Uh, at 10 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. KST. So we kindly ask for your participation as well. Thank you very much.